，电风没关吧？不影响什么？没有啊，嗯。
Tanya yang kerja. Thank you and Good afternoon from Bangkok, Thailand. 
My name is Rasita, Secret Korean Program Coordinator of NIDAC. Uh, NIDAC stands for Network for the Development of Agricultural Cooperatives in Asia and the Pacific. It was set up in 1991 by UNFAO, ILO, and ICA. It's headquartered in Bangkok. Today, I am pleased to welcome everyone to the International <laughs> Symposium on Innovative Technologies for the Sustainable Aquaculture Value Chain in Asia, jointly organized by NIDA, Anhui Academy, Agricultural Sciences, China, and Asian Institute of Technology, AIT, Thailand. The symposium aims to highlight the existing technologies and good practices of resource efficient aquaculture to benefit smallholder farmers and cooperative enterprises in the Asia Pacific region while developing collaborative networks among various stakeholder groups in sustainable aquaculture. It has prominent aquaculture leaders from the Asia Pacific region, including Cambodia, China, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and Uganda. So first of all, I would like to invite uh, Dr. K.R. Salin, Honorary Director of NIDA and Chair of Aquaculture Program AIT to address the participants and uh, to proceed further for the opening session. Please, sir. Thank you, Rosita. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction and uh, Thanks all the participants who have assembled today. Uh, the uh, symposium in the series that NIDAC has been organizing for the past uh, few months. Uh, this symposium is named or titled the uh, International Symposium on Innovative uh, Practices or Technologies for the Sustainable Aquaculture Value Chain in Asia. And uh, we know that the, the importance of aquaculture is, needs no emphasis. We all know the importance and uh, the challenges facing us uh, with the capture fisheries, almost stabilizing its production. And we are not expecting any further progress uh, in the capture fisheries production. Aquaculture is uh, perhaps the uh, most viable solutions for providing food for humankind. Uh, and the importance of fisheries cooperatives is uh, quite relevant in this context. And NIDAC, in fact, stands for a global collective for the development of aquaculture cooperatives, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Um, uh, if you see the program, uh, you can see that the, the speakers today come from a broad spectrum uh, of uh, or providing a cross-section of the Asian region. And we also have a very uh, interesting presentation from Africa uh, that you can see uh, providing uh, or highlighting the value addition of the aquaculture produce that is happening in Africa, which is quite relevant for the food security for humankind. Um, and specifically, I want to talk about the contribution of the Chinese partners in this. Uh, we are organizing this symposium with the kind collaboration with the Anhui Academy of Agriculture Sciences, which is a prestigious uh, research and academic organization in the Anhui province of China under the Chinese uh, Society uh, Academy of Agriculture Sciences. So uh, they have been quite, uh, you know, cooperative in organizing the symposium and with the support of Asian Institute of Technology, uh, we are able to organize this uh, international symposium today. Um, without much introduction, as we are going to have a very long session today and uh, uh, I would like to welcome all the participants uh, for attending this uh, international conference, uh, the symposium. And also I would like to welcome the 
Chinese delegates who are here uh, from the Anhui Academy, and also uh, almost 150 international participants who have registered for this conference, and I expect most of them are joining now. And uh, at this point, I would like to welcome Professor Jiang Elin, who is the leader of the Special Aquaculture Innovations Group at the Anhui Academy of Agricultural Sciences in China, uh, to say a few remark, uh, opening remarks, and also welcome our chief guest, uh, Professor Li Sefu, who is the president of the Anhui Academy of Agriculture Sciences today. Professor Jiang. Can you please open your camera and and I think there is a connection issue still. Professor Jiang, can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. I just. Uh... Uh, Mr. Zhang, just to let me to help him to translate some of the welcome speech to you. And today is an online and offline 2022 International Symposium on Initiative the Technologies for the Sustainable Agriculture Value Chain in Asia, held by the Agriculture Department of Anhui Academy of Agriculture Science and Asia Institute of Technology. And firstly, uh, we would like to introduce all the leaders and experts who just to represent our China and our industry elites. Uh, are Mr. Li Zefu, uh, the Director President of Anhui Academy of Agriculture Sciences. Yeah. And he is mainly engaged in rice gymnastics and blading, and he has undertaken more than 30 national and provincial projects and bleed more than 30, uh, 20 varieties. And he won nine national and provincial awards totally. Okay, next, uh, let me just uh, uh, introduce Mr. Jiang He. Uh, Jiang He is the director of Agriculture Institute of Anhui Academy of agriculture sciences, and he as the first batch of the experts of the agriculture in our Anhui province. And Ms. Julie Ni, uh, the Director of Scientific Research Division of Anhui Academy of Agriculture Sciences. And Mr. Ou Yangfeng, the Vice Director of Agriculture Institute of Anhui Academy of Agriculture Science. And uh, you know our researcher, Mr. Jiang Yeling, who is represent of our Chinese delegation, and he is in charge of today's conference. And Mr. Shaoling, the Chairman of Anhui Shuoran Intelligence Agricultural Development Corporation Limited. And Mr. Zhang Kelai, the chairman of Hefei Liu Xing Lanse Agricultural Cooperation Limited. And together, today, our delegation have some of their experts and professors from the Agriculture Institute of Anhui Academy of Agriculture Sciences. Uh, they are Mr. Li Zhi. Okay. And Ms. Fang Ting, um, Sun Wen, Chen Honglian, Ji Suo Fei, Song Guang Tong, Wang Fen, Chen Zhu, Xu Bing, Zhou Xiang, Xu Xiao Na, and Wang Jia Jia. So our delegation have the very warm welcome that's let you participate in our international symposium together. And we also have some online companies. The online companies we have 
的安徽喜家 Agricultural Development Corporation Limited, and we have the Tongcheng Sushi Ecological Agriculture Corporation Limited, and Ma Anshan Chunsheng Ecological Agriculture Corporation Limited. Okay, so next, I'd like to welcome our deputy, uh, the the vice president of Anhui Academy of Agriculture Science. Mr. Li Zefu to make a speech to all of us. Dear Professor Sailing, all experts, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very glad to be invited to attend the International Symposium on innovative technologies for the sustainable agricultural value chain in Asia, which is jointly organized by the Asian Institute of Technology and the Fishery, Fishery Institute of Anhui Academy of Agricultural Sciences. On behalf of the Anhui Academy of Agricultural Sciences, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all experts and the scholars attending this meeting. The Fisheries Institute is one of the 14 professional research institutes in our academy, mainly engaged in research on applied technology and applied basic in fishery production, rely on the Institute, three comprehensive experiment stations of a nation modern agriculture industry technology system has established. They are Hefei comprehensive experiment stations for bulk freshwater fish industry. Three and the cream industry technology, characteristic freshwater fish industry technology. Besides, the Institute has such scientific research platforms as Anhui Province Key Laboratory of Agriculture and Stock Enhancement, Anhui Center of Aquatic Technology Research and Development, and et cetera. The special agricultural technology innovation team led by Professor Jiang Ye Lin has made great efforts on international scientific cooperation and has established long-term cooperative relations, relations with the experts from countries along the Belt and Road, such as Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, and Myanmar, and has achieved some fruitful results. In terms of spatial agricultural technology, the team undertaken two projects sponsored by the State Administration of Foreign Exports Affairs of Ministry of Science and Technology of China, and more than 20 projects funded by Anhui Provincial Administration of Foreign Exports Affairs. In 2021, the agricultural technology of Chinese soft shell cattle was granted the second prize of Anhui Provincial Science and Technology Progress. Their achievements are inseparable from the support of the, of the experts of this symposium. The symposium provides a good communication platform for agriculture experts at home and, there and abroad. Through this meeting, I hope that we can further deepen our exchanges and cooperation to promote the healthy 
development of the special accord products industry in the Belt and Road countries. Finally, I wish Symposium a complete success. I wish all guests and friends smooth work and happy life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Li Sefu and Professor Jiang and colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for the overwhelming participation. And uh, we are also delighted to see the, the kind of industry participation you have ensured, the presence of uh, companies in China uh, who are interested in this symposium. Um, so to begin with the technical sessions of this symposium. Let me first welcome um, Professor Jiang Yelin uh, for his uh, opening presentation. And I have immense pleasure to invite Professor Jiang Yelin and uh, briefly introduce him to the audience. Uh, Professor Jiang Elin is the leader of the Special Aquatic Animal Culture Technology Innovation Team, uh, as well as the researcher and master advisor at the Anhui Academy of Agriculture Sciences. He has uh, uh, he has uh, several projects, more than forty projects of the National Spark Plans and Science and Technology Major Project. He has published more than 80 papers, 10 books, and four as editor-in-chief, and 28 authorized patents, uh, of which three are international patents. He has won nearly 20 awards for scientific research achievements and has developed and revised 12 provincial and local standards. He has good international cooperation with 18 national professional institutions, including the University of Texas, the University of Maryland, the Freshwater Research Center, the French Academy of Agriculture Sciences, the French Turtle Protection Federation, the Israeli Fish Central Laboratory, uh, Wasida University and the Asian Institute of Technology and several others. He has presided over 29 international cooperation projects and served as the head of 12 international delegations. On, on 3rd June, 2014, he was received by the President Xi Jinping at this great call of the people. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Jiang. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we are honored by your presence and uh, the stage is yours for your presentation. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can yes, hear okay, you. Okay, I will start it. Uh, good afternoon, dear leaders, professors, and uh, colleagues. I am Wang Fen from Fisheries Research Institute of Anhui Agriculture of Academy Sciences. Next, I will show you the achievements in special aquatic product, Chinese soft shelled turtle, on behalf of Professor Jiang Yilin and my team. Uh, Chinese soft shelled turtle distributed in Southeast Asian countries. And in China, the turtle was cultured in most provinces, except Qinghai, Tibet, and Xinjiang province. The earliest record was the classic fish breeding, written in the Warring States period. Nourishing yin and tonifying yang is the general recognition of the nutritional value of Chinese soft shelled turtle by the Chinese people. The turtle could improve human immunity and have the positive effect on the uh, lupus erythema totus leukemia and some immunological diseases. In recent years, we found that the meat of the turtle was rich in unsaturated fatty acids, especially omega-3 series, and have healthy care effects on um, cardio vascular and cerebrovascular disease, cholesterol, and other diseases. Because of the high nutritional value with the increase of market value, the breeding technology and output are increasing year by year. 
and the breeding output has nearly tripled than that of 2000 a year. Anhui province located in the Yangtze River Basin and was the major producing province of the turtle, which take about 10% of the national output. Uh, next, I will introduce in detail. To ensure, to ensure the uh, fertilization rate, the male and the female individuals with the no body surface injury and little weight differences are chosen. The radio is 1.5 to 1.8, and the fertilization rate is above uh, 95%. During incubation, the temperature was controlled in the range of 20 to 22 degree and the humidity incre increased with the incubation time. And the incubation period is uh, 44 to 55 to 50 days. Anhui located in the middle of lower reaches of the Yangtze River, and the temperature is lower than uh, zero degree. The mortality of juveniles is high in natural condition especially the juveniles produced in September. So overwintering in greenhouse between the become the first choice. The temperature control is the most important of the greenhouse. Temperature control mainly consists of two parts, insulation and temperature supply. Seven layers are used for insulation mainly including heating pre preservation cotton and plastic, while ground source heat pump air conditioning system is the most common heating system, which could dis discharge carbon dioxide and other polluting gases. Within the meanwhile, the power consumption is low. The turtle is fierce in nature and easy to bite each other especially under the condition of high breeding density. And it's very easy to get sick or even die. The net covered are set to provide a palace for them to hide and inhabit, avoiding the probability of mutual biting. During the breeding process, the dissolved oxygen in the water should be more than five milligram per limit so as to ensure that the protein in the water can be effectively transformed into low toxic nitrate. The water, the water quality control is also an important part in greenhouse culture. This is the, this, 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 this is the dredging system. When dredging, pull out the white plastic pipe until the residue bite and faces are completely discharged and the change of the water surface in the aquaculture pond shall not exceed three centimeter. So it's a hard had a stress effect on the turtle. In addition, ecological candle is built around the greenhouse and the aquatic tail water treatment project is built. The above facilities and equipment can significantly improve the growth performance of the turtle, and the disability rate is reduced by 7.2 times. The breeding period in greenhouse is about 10 months, and the eco economic benefit is about $5,338. And the one greenhouse take about 800 square meter. After greenhouse rising, the turtle can grow to about 500 gram. And the next step is to transfer to out pond for breeding. Or co culture with rice and aquatic vegetables, which is, where, which is also the model of comprehensive planting and breeding vigorously promoted at the present. Because the co-culture model could promote the quality of rice, vegetable, and turtle. In the meanwhile, the economic and ecological effect are promoted too.
The co-culture of rice turtle fish has the largest comprehensive planting and breeding area at the present, and the channel is digger around the rice field, and the turtle and fish are stocked at the appropriate proportion. Generally speaking, the stocking density should not exceed three turtles per square meter, which could cause rice logging, and the economic benefit could be up to um, two one three two eight dollars per hectare. It's it's very high. It can be seen from this table that the testing of soft-shelled turtle in the co in the comprehensive model is significantly higher than that in greenhouse outside pond model. To some extent, it explains that why the price of soft-shelled turtle and the co co comprehensive model is almost the price that of the pond culture. Lutas is an aquatic vegetable within the largest planting area. In this model, the planting area of lutas should be controlled at 30 to 50 percent because too much area of lutas will cause problems such as the low water temperature and the scratches on the body surface of the turtle. In addition, co-culture can significantly improve the survival rate of the turtle and reduce the, the feed the uh, reduce the, the feed co-efficiency. Compared with the lutas moon culture and the turtle moon culture, co-culture of lutas and turtle could improve the economic benefit, which is 261.99 per hectare. It's very high too. Zizania uh, lutifolia. Is a unique aquatic vegetable in China, and the economic benefit is of stocking soft shelled turtle in the field is also very considerable. It's about $16485 per hectare. Most products are sold directly, but the price is higher than that of moon culture. That of moon culture. Uh, Lutas seed are processed into uh, one, uh, which improves the commercial values. As we described above, the turtle is a precious uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So the turtle is processed into turtle shell paste and uh, pill. Uh, this team has been established since the 1990s and has hold more than 40 national and provincial projects obtained 10 rewards, 70 authorized patients, three books, and more than 30 papers. Uh, it's the rewards certificate. Uh, those are the uh, patient is uh, some. And our, rich, and our achievements also have been highly prized by the academicians. Uh, this turtle is the way uh, we choose the new, we choose the, is the new variety, Xi Jia Yi Hao. Uh, those are the main members of our team and the four, and the four, four professors and the two doctors and two doctors are included. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Wang Fan, and thank you, Professor Jiang. Uh, very interesting work. And I think uh, for many of us, uh, many in this meeting, the, the social turtle would be a new species. Uh, although we have seen in Thailand, quite a few farmers are still doing the, the social turtle. And uh, I think, uh, many of the participants uh, will have some questions. So uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, please post it in the chat box. 
so that uh, the the speakers will have a chance to reply to your questions at the end of all the presentations. We have a Q and A session. Um, so let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Somani Thai. Somani is again uh, my good friend. He's a director of the Department of Aquaculture Development at the Fisheries Administration in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries in Cambodia. He's also serving as a project manager of the Cambodia Aquaculture Development Program, Capfish Aquaculture, uh, which runs from 2019 to 2023, uh, funded by the European Union. Uh, Dr. Somani and his colleagues have devoted all our efforts to promoting and developing aquaculture research, education, development and extension in Cambodia through various development and research projects with international agencies. He had received his uh, master's in aquaculture from Deakin University, Australia in 1998, and MBA in foods uh, and agriculture industries from Royal Agriculture University, England in 2002. He was a director of Marine Aquaculture Research and Development Center, Marta Cambodia, before being promoted to the director of the Department of Aquaculture Development. He has also worked as project manager or coordinator in various projects in fisheries management, rice field fisheries management and aquaculture development, both freshwater and marine in Cambodia for more than 20 years. So, so many please, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can yeah, please. Uh, you can start your presentation, uh, Somani. Okay. Uh, can can you see? You, can you see now? Yes. Uh, you can make it in the presentation mode. It's now. It's done. In mid. Okay. Thank you, Salin. And first, I'd like to thank to the uh, Rasita, the coordinator of NEDAZ, and then the Dr. Salin, the AIG. Uh, uh, Asian Institute of Technology and also the Anway uh, Academy of the Agricultural Science uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to organize this uh, symposium and then for inviting me to uh, share some thought on the innovation in small-scale agriculture in Cambodia. <laughs> so I think, as you know, that uh, Cambodia, uh, for agriculture perspective, will be growing faster, as you can see, but uh, however, the small and medium uh, uh, holder are still the driving force for the growth of aquaculture in Cambodia. <laughs> and then uh, palm uh, system is still the main production system. And then the, the species will be Pongasis, the striped catfish, giant snakehead, silver bark, and the uh, major uh, uh, contribution to the production around 65%. And then also for the Pancasius, the striped catfish, silver barb, and tilapia are driving around 70% of annual growth. However, out of the last 10 years, you can see that uh, there is a growth around 20% uh, by year. You can see the species on the pictures that uh, those four species that dominant uh, in the uh, production system. And then of course, the fish consumption is really high in Cambodia. Uh, I think double compared to the uh, global average, uh, our global standards. Uh, you can see that, um, and we are more around 40, 42 uh, kilogram per percent per year. <laughs> and then the driver for growth, you can see because increase of the demand from the population growth and large uh, expand, especially the tourist industry and also the local tourists uh, as well. And then of course, there's no growth in fisheries uh, management, fishery development in Cambodia. And uh, the profit maximization from the rice system that we have as an uh, agricultural country, so we can integrate it with the uh, uh, rice system for, the, for the increasing the production of agriculture. And then the suitable landscape and skill. So the, uh, the farmers also will also adapting to the agriculture integrated with the rice system as well. And input available now because of the, uh, uh, the, the the trading system now improve in the region. So now and then also yeah, globally. So now the assess the fingerlings, the feed and fertilization, 
and also the uh, technology transfer via internet also is a uh, in the COVID-19 situation. You see, you can see that a lot of newcomer in Afapajo also are starting uh, this uh, industry. And the national international investment also coming up and for Afapajo development in Cambodia. And of course, it's the, the priorities by the regional government of Cambodia that uh, Afapajo is one of the uh, 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 pillar in the uh, economy development in Cambodia. So there are, of course, there are some challenges that the Cambodia agriculture is still facing. The high dependency on feeding of trash fish and competitiveness uh, with the regional producer across neighboring country and also cross-border non-regulated trading that you can see that, uh, that affecting the uh, uh, growth of the local uh, producer and a large dependency on international supply of fingerling and feet and uh, limited institutional capacity to maintain the growth and limited national expert. And although we are trying to, to do that, to uh, produce more young uh, uh, researcher or young uh, graduate and projected change on water regime due to climate change and human intervention in the upstream. Limited capacity of smallholder to deal uh, with answer, uh, environmental uncertainty and to adopt new technologies. So the innovation M2 uh, small and medium holders are broadly categorized in four segments. So I start from the bottom one, the integration, adoption, adapta adaptation, and ecological intensification. This is an interesting uh, uh, segment that I think the rice aquaculture and cropping system intensification, rice prawn integration, mud crab in the mangroves, and we call mangrove friendly aquaculture, and then green the landscape and frog rice, frog fish rice integration. This is a circular nutrient use. Then followed by efficiencies and sustainability. So this is how to uh, transfer from the uh, totally use of trash fish to the pallet and feeding local resources and zero fish meal feed and efficient feeding. And then digital and green tech technology at the, at the, at, at the, at the moment is the, the in artificial intel, intellig, intelligent, uh, intelligence for decision making for smallholder and passive solar aeration and ground for farm management. And then the, the fourth segment is non-fish farming. And you can see the uh, frog uh, and then crayfish and prawn. And also there are some successors to farming at the moment also uh, in Cambodia. Here is, uh, I'd like to elaborate more on the innovation from trash fish to pellets. So uh, totally uh, the snake, the snakehead and the giant snakehead and, and then the, the, the sea bass normally de depend totally on the, on, on the trash fish. And then the, in fact, these trash fish are nutritious uh, to the human diet as well. So because of the previously, because of the richness of the um, and productive, high productivity of the less uh, fishery, that's why uh, aquaculture commodity at the time and even now totally depend on the, the feeding of the trash fish to this fish. But at the moment, uh, the pellet uh, is taking uh, up uh, on this on those species, the snakehead, the pangasis, and sea bass uh, culture as well. So the, uh, the innovation is ready to scale and scaling in the progress and then uh, what we are doing now by the fishery administration. And then uh, for feeding local resources, yes, uh, from extensive to improve extensive. So this one uh, with the, the Silver barb and walking, uh, silver barb walking catfish and tilapia and pongkasis that uh, we use uh, like uh, for silver barb using the and uh, using the available res local resources, yeah, uh, duckweeds to feed it and then the worm so to feed the the, the fish, the culture in the pond system. And then from uh, the zero uh, fish meal feed, uh, so this is we try to replace the using the soy uh, soy uh, soy uh, the soy meal. There's uh, and the CAS project is a commercial aquaculture for sustainable trade uh, funded by the uh, USDA of America. So the, this is to try to uh, uh, feed the, also uh, the, the, the pellet uh, produced with the soy meal and then feed to the uh, uh, striped snakehead and uh, tilapia, pangrasset and catfish. And also the improved feeding system that uh, Basically, that also we use a lot of trash fish, but also that at the same time, there's a good innovation of using the feeding tray. 
uh, from the bottom then uh, of the tray. So while pre 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 preventing the, the fish to fall into the pond bottom, this is saving a lot of our uh, trash fish and then also uh, reducing the water pollution as well. Just for the, the AI, artificial intelligence that I were mentioning is that uh, is at, the, at, at this stage is just to prove the concept. We already the, the first stage already uh, conducted, the, the assessment already conducted, but uh, now proposal already being submitted to uh, submitted, and then this is implemented by the Cam Tech University with uh, Fishery Administration and then CIRAT is a French research institute. And then this one is a sun oxygen system that's a passive solar aeration for green intensification for small holder aquaculture that's uh, implemented uh, by Smiling Gego and Fishery Administration and on the tilapia species. And then uh, it's being proved, uh, the, the concept is being proved and then not yet uh, finalized and then for scaling up, for scaling yet, yep. But it's showing that uh, it can work at the moment. And then uh, the, the backyard farming of frog and crayfish. So this is less land occupancy and, and but require high care and high, but at the same time also high profit. So the the, the red swamp uh, crayfish, uh, crawfish and also the red tail, uh, red uh, the red uh, the red claw uh, crayfish also being also uh, farmed and uh, at the backyard and uh, quite popular now and um, uh, in throughout the country of Cambodia. And also the frog farming, also frog breeding and hatchery also is, is a kind of one of the now become one of the commodity and become popular because it's uh, require a uh, short time to culture for the production and, and harvesting and selling. And then and also the calf flows also return quicker uh, compared to other uh, like Hongkazis uh, or strike Australia, strike strike catfish culture requiring high uh, investment also the long term period. And then this is also uh, kind of interesting that uh, the fishery administration with the CIRAD and then IRD, the French Research Institute, we are doing together to prove that uh, integration of the uh, all male macrobrachium uh, in the rice system with the rice field. So it can improve uh, higher profit, higher production. You can see that. So better production, you can see, uh, and, and, and higher profit from the selling of the macro bracket into the market. And then the cropping system intensification of rice system and ecological intensification of rice aquaculture. So now this uh, also we introduced this new system that uh, we introduced fish culture and with the clumping perch, as you can see, uh, from March to uh, June and from July, the wet season, we start uh, fish culture and uh, and uh, and also the 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 rice and then stocking some zero bar for stocking and then also wild fish population also increased. Interestingly, for more than twenty five fish species harvested and six percent wild fish annually productive deal around four ton per tap. And also we got profit around two thousand US dollars per tap per year. So this are uh, trying to revive back the, uh, the 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 rice field ecosystem as well and. Uh, so it's also increasing the uh, biodiversity of the of the uh, rice field fishery as well. So this is implemented by Atra, TCO, the local NGO, and the CIRAD and IND and Fishery Administration. And then this uh, we call frog fish rice integration for circularity. So so this is also uh, interesting. Like similarly in China and in way you're doing with the soft circular in the rice field. So we just introduced this uh, uh, the frog culture in the hapa, uh, in the pond and rice. This is what we are trying to do. And then you, we know that uh, Cambodia is one of the remaining country in the Mekong region that having the uh, uh, untouched or uh, pristine uh, uh, potential brew stock uh, in the deep pool uh, of the Mekong, upstream Mekong, uh, upstream Mekong fishery. So that's why we're working with the uh, one of the Mekong project that uh, we try to uh, buy, we try to buy, we try to collect this young June, uh, young Lavi and buy the big one, and then we uh, uh, maintain and, cult uh, and culture in our research center 
and then we do the DNA study and see how the, the population from year to year have uh, they are different in terms of the genetic makeup, gender diversity, are they different? If they are totally different, they are, um, our wild population, blue stock population are, are, are in a good shape. But if it turned out that uh, the gene uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, show that there's no differences between the last 10 year parents, parent, uh, uh, last 10 year of the sample and then now they are the same. And so, and then we are kind of worried that because I mean that our uh, population in the wild are not in a good shape for the long term resistance. And then you can see we also do uh, this for greening the landscape of pond dye with fruit trees, so coconut and, and uh, yellow uh, banana. So this kind of uh, try to uh, get more income from the using the, the from the dike uh, of the rife, rife fish integration. So of course it's required investment for, for making the dye and also taking some longer time for the coconut, uh, aroma coconut to get a return and the same banana as, as well. And then, uh, but uh, the macrobra can return also can subsidize the cost of the greening and, um, and, and wider dike. This project is under a FACAM project by FIA, IRD, and CIRA. Then I'd like to say thank you for your attention and enjoy the, uh, the food here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Somani. Very, very interesting because I know a lot of developments happening in Cambodia and I, you are super busy. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking your time and uh, highlighting some of the interesting developments. Uh, I think we may have a few questions coming up. So please uh, uh, stay back so we can have an interaction at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, again. Sorry for my camera issues. I am actually uh, traveling now, so my connection is not that great. So my camera doesn't pop up all the time. Um, so uh, let me invite the next presenter, the, the speaker, Dr. Tuan Pham An. Uh, Dr. Tuan is the vice president of the Vietnam Fishery Society, Winafis. And he has over 40 years of experience working in aquaculture, including induced breeding and fish hatchery technology, genetic improvement, food safety, policy development, and dissemination. He holds an, a master's in aquaculture from the Asian Institute of Technology. He's a, our proud alumnus and a PhD in fish genetics from the University of Wales, Swansea. He worked as a researcher and lecturer at the University of Fisheries and uh, and the Research Institute for Aquaculture in Vietnam. Dr. Tuan recently has engaged with private companies and banks on aquaculture investment opportunities and has undergone various technical and commercial projects for tilapia and shrimp aquaculture in Vietnam. He's also a fully qualified aquaculture auditor against a variety of sustainability standards for ASC, BAP, and organic standards. So welcome, Dr. Tuan. Uh, the floor is yours. So thank you, Dr. Salin. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can. All right, so uh, I will be invited to participate at this uh, international symposium. So I'm very happy to uh, have a chance to present a very brief advanced technology and the current practice in aquaculture in Vietnam. So uh, aquaculture is a very important sector in Vietnam. The government of Vietnam is considered aquaculture is uh, one of the important sector for food consumption, also for economic developments. So you see this is a figure to show the development of the aquaculture in Vietnam for the last year from 2010 to 20, 2020, both the area and the production rapid increase. So the figure of aquaculture in Vietnam in 2020 is 
The total aquaculture production uh, is more than 4 million tons, cover an uh, area of 1.2 million hectares. So this is a big uh, production, also the big area for aquaculture in Vietnam. Uh, we, in the tropical country, so we farm a number of species, but of course we have some main cultures species. They are shrimp, bangashus, monus, and tilapia. Shrimp we farm oh, black tiger shrimp and wild shrimp. The total area is about 540,000 hectares, which is total production in 2020 is 900 million ton. This is accounting for almost 20% of total aquaculture production in Vietnam. The second important farm species is the catfish, flatwater catfish, pangasius. This is mainly farm in the Mekong Delta area. The total area of the uh, catfish is just only 5,500. But it yield more than 1.5 million ton per year, accounting for more than 30% of total aquaculture production in Vietnam. Monusca, uh, clam, uh, is many culture species, with total and almost 1,000 tons, cover almost 10% of total agricultural production in Vietnam. Tilapia also is a very important farm species in Vietnam. They farm in flat and bucket water with uh, almost 300,000 tons per year. So now I want to preview some advanced innovation in agriculture in Vietnam. Firstly, this year, quality of seed is a very important for aquaculture success. We have a number of research to develop the selected breeding in aquaculture species, particularly for Bangasut and tilapia. We has a family selection, mainly for growth performance of Pangasius and tilapia. Right now, we have a four selected generation of Pangasius and tilapia, with growth performance improved from six to 8% per generation. The four selected stock of Pangasius and tilapia have been disseminated to the hatchery in the country. Most of the hatchery in the country have received a selected stock of pangasut and tilapia. So the selected printing of tilapia is capable of the growth of farmer of these species farm in our condition. The other innovation is the all male production of flat with the front, macro programs to Sambaki. Uh, front is a very commonly farm in Vietnam, mainly in flat with the area. But recently, for the last five or to ten years, we also introduced to farm macro plankium in the particular area. So this is also very important. But the problem is that uh, if the mistake of the farm is, uh, has a variation inside as the habiting time, also has a low demand. So if it has a production of the all male farm, we can have a better growth and we have a larger size of the farm. So we develop the all male front by two solutions because the uh, micro solution. And the second solution is we use DNA technique to record the uh, INA uh, technology to produce 
all of leo female. If we have a leo female to cross which normally we can have the old male front. So this technique is a very uh, uh, helpful to produce all male production of the front. Right now, the front culture in Vietnam use all male production. So this I have to brief about how we can produce the old male front in Vietnam. You see, as uh, it is a lot, uh, usually we, we have a uh, normal male and uh, normal female, we can have 50% uh, of uh, female and 50% of uh, male. If we as a, uh, we call chocolate clan, this one, we can remove the chocolate clan, it means the normal female will be, become the male female. So if we have the male female, we cross normal, we can produce all the male production. So this is it. But the, the problem of the micro search and anthropogenic clan is that we need uh, some skin worker. Also, we take a lot of time. So it hard to produce as a mass production of all female. So our, for the last two years, we succeed in the technique of the DNA technique. We, we produce uh, uh, RNA information. Uh, chain so we can make the injection so we can easy to produce all the male female so that's why we have succeed to produce all the male front for front culture in Vietnam. The other one advanced technology uh, we want to introduce you is a uh, super intensive production of panga shoes. Uh, we uh, farm banga shoot in large pond, usually it's from uh, SI from 2000 to 5,000 square meter, which very deep pond, 3.5 to 5 meter deep. So stock very high, stock intensity from 60 to 100 uh, fingerling per square uh, per cubic meter. And we use complete its billet phase, which uh, Crude protein from 26 to 30 percent it depends on uh, the state of the culture and the size of the banka suit uh, using the farming. Also feeding draining from one to seven percent of body weight. So we're very high aeration and water exchange. So the productivity of such kind of super intensive production banka suit we can produce from 150 to 500 per hectare crop with FCR from 1.5 to 1.7. So more of the uh, tilapia farming a certificate for global ZIP or MSC or Viet ZIP certification. So from the total area of the Bangkok food culture, it's only 5,200 hectares, but we produce total feed production 1.2 million tons per year. What about the advanced or uh, innovation in soil farming? The first thing I want to introduce is a two state of farming of swim. So instead of state of farming, we move to two state of farming. The first state is the nursing of the post larvae. From the bola fee, we lost them for a period of 15 to 30 days in 10. By small pan, which are lessening density from 2000 to 4000 pl per square meter. So, for the second state, we grow in pond or in tank. So, by applying I mean, we have a better disease control. So, with the two state of uh, swim farming using uh, the FPA, so, so we can use a probiotic uh, farming, so it helps improve a uh, survival of so the productivity of sim. So this is a two state of farming of sim is now a common practice in Vietnam. The 
the decision technology also have been introduced to uh, aquaculture farming in Vietnam. So this is a figure to show the feeding system with uh, feeder automatic feeding using the solar power control. So this one is very uh, promise uh, solution for improve the shrimp farming in Vietnam. But so far, this uh, balloting in some farm area. So, but it's a very promising uh, solution. Also, we uh, have some uh, smart aquaculture solution, for example, so, uh, for EPC solution, aquatic solution. This is an IT solution to help uh, control the quality and quantity of the PL before stopping in the pond. This is solution to help you to make sure the number of the PL we want to stop in the pond. We can make the evaluation of the quality of the PL in terms of size, in terms of the even uh, the variation size of the PL before stopping. Also, this uh, solution also can help the farmer to better monitoring of the growth performance of the uh, stream in the pond. Also, we can predict the productivity and the size of the stream at the habitat. So this solution has a producer to reduce the pond management. So the current this solution is uh, piloting in some pond area. But also this is a very promising uh, option for the farmer trying to improve their productivity in the stream farming, in particularly in aquaculture as a whole. The other we want to deal with the rice stream system. You see, a rice stream system is uh, in Vietnam have started in early uh, 1970 because you see the it's bad to showing the metal delta in the alarm. We have a different area. This is delta mainly for right culture, but the problem of the saline extrusion. So some area in is a cotton area affected by the saline intrusion. So, but really in the dry season, they had to continue with the dry farming. So that's why we move to the rice and swim farming, one crop of dry and another crop of swim, particularly in the dry season, which uh, because in the dry season, we have the saline, it has a very uh, high temperature. We shot it of the flat water. So we are not able to do the second crop of rye. So we move to the second crop of stream instead of farming rye. So the advantage of the rye stream farming is that we have a low port production of the rye and stream. Also, the quality of dry and sheep is so higher. And we have a leverage, particularly for a disease for sheep. So it means sustainable development of the system. So in the context of the climate exchange, this is an adaptation to the climate change in for the Mekong Delta, particularly for the cotton area. So, at Ilzua, the old system is an excessive farming with very low productivity of the stream, generally from 100 to 200 kg per hectare. But we improve the system for higher productivity of stream. Also, is an option, is a solution to adapt with the climate change in our country. Also, you see, for seam farming, we had two species. This is a black tiger seam and wildlife seam. This area we want to maintain, particularly for the black tiger seam. 
So how we improve the stream dry system? Firstly, we had to improve so we had to improve the sound, the sounding chain and die. So you see, this is some picture to show how the system to be improved in terms of the dry area, also the chain and the die around the dry area. The second one is that we lose the post larvae before stocking in the system. So this means we have a larger stream stock in the right to improve the survival of the stream in the system. Also, we make sure how stocking density we want to stock to see which the environment in the system. So this is stock density of seam are controlled. Has a supplemented fitting because we have the highest stocking as a user, as a traditional system. So right now the seam system in the right area, we can have a productivity of the 400 to 1000 kg per hectare of seam. Right and four to right. Crop. You see, this is system where currently we have more than 200,000 hectares. The area for the Russian system is dependable because of the climate change, because the more saline intrusion is the denter. So, this uh, system we see the potential for expansion, also, in potential of the improved the productivity, also. We have some improvement for the marine cat aquaculture. A tradition cat culture is from the wooden. Now we move to the ATP case. So it has a, a better survive with the, the hard condition in the uh, cotton area in the sea. Also fingerling from the white pollution who uh, fingerling produce from the hatchery, also move from the chair feet as a feet to the village feet for the existing system. Also, the environment for the great aquaculture is now the monitoring regularly by the producer. Also, we start to make uh, ZIP certification for the great aquaculture area. So we equalize the technology innovation and dissimulation in the country is a very important for the develop sustainable agriculture in our country. So that's why the more investment from uh, the government, it means from the public sector, also private sector for innovative technology. Also we, uh, a uh, span a lot of training and demonstration of technology extension for the producer in aquaculture. Every two years, we have one of the very big event we call the V-Swim. V-Swim is a swim aquaculture fair. We organize every two years. So this is a fair to introduce a new technology in swim farming. So the science, the research, uh, researchers, the producer, the investment when come to the fair to share the information, to learn the new technology and cooperation in research or in uh, production. So the, we see this is a very good event to a more sustainable aquaculture in Vietnam, particularly for the steam sector. So the, Next event is the Vestream 2023, with the title Improving Stream Value Chain. That's uh, occurred during the April 12 to 14 in Kansu. So, this is the chance we want to show how in innovative technology of aquaculture, particularly for stream. So, we are uh, Welcome to join our vision. So thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Chuvan. Uh, very interesting. And uh, uh, as you highlighted, Vietnam is such an amazing country with great progress in, in embracing advanced technologies and that you have portrayed well in your presentation. Um, thank you very much. And I think uh, we'll have a few questions uh, at the end of this session. Uh, and before moving to the next session, uh, I have a small announcement. Uh, please uh, note that these sessions are being recorded and live streamed in the YouTube channel of uh, NIDAC, official YouTube channel. So you can later also watch, watch the recording video, recorded video. And uh, please also don't forget to post your questions in the chat uh, box in the Zoom window. So from Vietnam, from China to Cambodia to Vietnam, and now we are moving to Indonesia, another great producer of aquaculture commodities. We have Dr. Romy Nobriadi. Uh, he's the vice chairman of the Indonesia Aquaculture Society, which is the major professional fisheries uh, society in Indonesia. And he's uh, also a lecturer at the Jakarta Technical University of Fisheries uh, and under the Ministry of Marine Affairs and the Fisheries of the Republic of Indonesia. He has published more than 30 peer-reviewed research articles. His PhD dissertation was on evaluation of advanced soy products in diets fed to Florida Pompano. And his master thesis was on a toolbox for immune parameters of artemia. So uh, with his industry experience, uh, Dr. Romy is currently working as a promoter uh, to link research institutes with industry to review the feed formulations and manufacturing processes shrimp and aquaculture production, aquafeed management practices, and identifying relevant research to enhance aquaculture productivity and efficiency. He's also a great friend uh, of ours. And uh, Dr. Romy, please. You can start your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Prisna Salin, for a very nice introduction. So first of all, I would like to say thank you for NEDAC and also for the associates for inviting me to this uh, conference, to the International Symposium of Innovative Technology for the Sustainable Value Chain. So today, this afternoon, I would like to talk about the development of functional feed and also the technology for steam production system. I would like to start my presentation today with the information from the Global Aquaculture Alliance. That, uh, they said that aqua feed costs and also disease prevention become uh, the most challenge in the how to um, optimize the productivity in stream production system. If you look at the number five, aquafit also become another challenge, but this is in terms of the quality. So there are two main challenges in aquafit. There's a, this is a cost and also the quality. Then if we're talking about the cost, we need to talk, discuss more about how to replace the use of the expensive ingredients in the diet formulation. So in, in this case, we talk about the case study of fish meal replacement. So there's an ongoing research right now. There's a massive research right now how to replace the fish meal as the expensive protein source. And it, especially in these three species, the complete or partial replacement of fish meal using the alternative protein source demonstrate equivalent or higher growth in the animals than the control fish meal diet. So the thing is, there is a, still a possibility to increase the efficiency of the productivity by try to reduce the use of expensive uh, protein source like a fish meal or animal meal with the alternative protein source. So what is the other, what is the sustainable ingredients that we use as the alternative to replace the use of the fish meal? So there are several alternative ingredients. Uh, we can use the soy meal, we can use the cotton seed meal, the corn protein and the canola meal uh, because we, we know that in the past, in 1919, in our diet formulation, we use animal meal a lot. We use the fish meal a lot, around 69%. And then we only use the plant protein source is around 90%. At the present time, with the massive research that we do right now, we actually can significantly reduce the inclusion level of the animal meal up to, well, from 69 to 31%. And then we increase the inclusion level of the plant protein source from 19% in the 1990 up to 53%. But in the future, we would like to increase more the inclusion level of the plant protein source in the diet formulation. 
So this is how we make our aquaculture system become more sustainable. Then we have to think how to reduce the 30% in the present time only to, into 10% for the all aquaculture species in, in, the, in this uh, aquaculture industry. So by for doing that one, we still need the minor ingredients and also the feeding alternative and also the attractants to be included in the diet formulation. So if we're talking about the alternative protein source, we know the soybean is uh, used a lot in the in the meal industry, and also there are several alternatives like the DGS. But if we can, if we compare the price between soy protein and also the DGS, we see there is a gap here. So this is the data from 2021 in September. We know that uh, right now even the high price for the soy protein is even higher. We know that the feed meal already increased the feed cost for many, many times in this 2022. But if we can see the, uh, uh, a comparison for alternative protein source like soy protein and also the DGS, there is a significant gap here. And also this is a very interesting if we can blend them with the proper blending system to replace also the use of the fish meal. So this is an option for blending ingredients to increase, also optimize the proximate, uh, the crude protein level, also the balance of the amino acid in the diet formulation. We know that fish meal, they have a high protein content, they have a high lipid content, a high lysine and so a high level in the methionine. But if you blend them with the proper uh, plant protein source, like, and then we substitute with the corn protein and also soy protein uh, with the high protein content in the corn protein and moderate level of protein in the soy protein, but they can combine together because corn is low in lysine, but soy protein is high in lysine. If we properly blend them, we can see there is uh, some uh, balance in the amino acid profile. To bring the attention of, uh, uh, of you in this uh, blending system, we try to analyze the use of the DDGS as a protein source in the practical diets for Pacific white shrimp with the banana. So this is how we formulate the diet. We reduce the inclusion, we reduce the inclusion, we maintain the inclusion level of fish meal and try to reduce the soy protein with the corn DDGS here. So if we can see the amino acid profile and also the proximate analysis, we do not see any uh, significant difference in terms of the at least the three emitting amino acid here, the methionine, the lysine, and thymine. So this is a, a comparable value between the 5% DGS, 10% DGS, and 15% DGS. But if you look at the growth performance of the shrimp, we do not see any significant difference in terms of growth uh, between 5% DGS, 10% DGS, and 15% to replace the use of the soy protein in our deformation. We know that the soy protein have a high uh, price, high price compared to DGS. And, but the good news is we can actually reduce the formulation cost. We can actually develop the economically strong practical diet here for shrimp or vaname. In 2020, with the price at the, at the time, we can actually, the feed meal can actually save up to 1.9% in the, in the feed formulation cost. With the price in 2021, the feed meal actually can save 3.05% by replacing the soy protein or replacing the expensive animal protein by using the, the low economical value of the protein source, but at the same time, the stream do not have any significant difference in terms of the growth performance. So this is a, a, a new strategy, how to develop the economically social diet in the future. Then we, we can think how to make a proper blending system here to replace expensive uh, ingredients in the, our diet formulation, especially for stream production system. Nowadays, uh, Farmers now tends to go for functional feed. We know that uh, there is a tendency right now in the farmers try to decrease the incidence of the disease outbreaks and also the need to decrease the dependence of fish meal and also fish oil in the aqua feed formulation. So the definition of the functional feed here, feed that provides superior performance, then we can achieve using a conventional feed. How we can do this? We can incorporate a special ingredients inside of the formulation that could promote the growth, the health, and also the survival of the organisms. So what can be included in the diet formulation? We can, we, can in, uh, we can use the yeast extract, we can use the phytogenics there, we can use the probiotics, we can use the nucleotides, we can also use the prebiotic substances and other uh, functional ingredients that we can use to produce the functional feed. So this is uh, just one 
uh, example of the phytogenics, we already tried uh, several uh, active substances that coming from plant, like uh, for instance, like from sweet chestnut and also yucca skidegera. They have the hydrolysable tannins here that we use for our diet formulation. And this is how we formulate diet. We use the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and also 0.3% of the hydrolysable tannins. And then we put it, the, this uh, substance into our diet formulation. And we can see that there is no problem in the proximate and also the amino acid content here. And also the group performance, even there is no statistical difference, but we can see that numerically in terms of number here for final mean weight, we can see there is a there is an increase in terms of the mean weight, and also there is a decrease in terms of the FCR, and also there is an increase in terms of the weight gain percentage. And, but the good news is this hydrolysable tannins can actually increase the total hemocyte count in the Pacific white stream, and also the number of the lysosome activity. And this is meaning that the, we can increase the first defense mechanism of the Vaname against the pathogen. And the other uh, functional ingredients that we can use is nucleotides, because nucleotides is the building blocks of the nucleic acid. And we also know this uh, substance as the immunomodulator for the aquatic organisms. In our COVID production system, the recommended dose is uh, around 500 until 1,000 gram uh, per ton of uh, feed for, uh, production system. So this is, uh, we have also have a reason to see what is the efficacy and how is the effectivity of nucleotides in diet formulation. So we formulate our diet by using 0.05 here and also 0.1% of nucleotides in our, in our uh, diet formulation. And we can see here, if you can see the, the reference here, 0.05 and 0.1. Actually, if we compare to the control without the inclusion of the nucleotides in diet formulation, we, can, we have a significant increase in the total hemocyte count in the Pacific white stream of Baname, and also significant increase in terms of the lysosome activity with proper number of the nucleotide. And then when we challenge them with the Vibrio Harvey in the in over seven days period, and then we can see that the nucleotide actually can also act as the immunomodulator. They can also protect the, the shrimp from, against the pathogen by increasing the non-specific immune system. We know that the shrimp do not have the adaptive and specific, but they can also increase the non-specific immune system in shrimp and then increase the survival rate during the, during the challenge test. And I also would like to talk about the other functional ingredients that we can use to produce the functional fit here. We can also use the yeast because yeast can also act as, as, act as the potential immune stimulant for stream. We, uh, we already discussed about the lack of adaptive immune system in the stream. So we really need to have a substance that can also increase and also enhance the non-specific immune system in the, in the stream. So we use the high protein DDGS here that still contain 25% in the product that this is still goes to our uh, diet formulation. And this is how we formulate the diet. Use a 6%, 12%, and also 18% of the fermented pork with yeast. And then we try to re, uh, input this in our diet formulation. And in terms of the growth performance, we can see there is a significant increase in terms of the growth of the stream using the yeast in the, in the diet formulation. And also when we challenge them with the ESPND with our colleague in Vietnam, we can see that the, there is an increase in terms of the survival rate of stream when we challenge them with the ESPND compared to the control treatment that do not fit with the yeast in, in the diet formulation. So after the, uh, the production of economically sound uh, practical diet and also the production of the functional feed, we would like to talk about the technology right now in the same culture system, especially in, in, in Indonesia right now, uh, because our government would like to increase the productivity up to 250% in 2024. And this has become our ambition here to, to grow our stream productivity and then to increase the, the welfare of our uh, social community here in, in Indonesia. <coughs> Sorry. So we know that there is evolution in stream farming production system from extensive, semi-intensive, the intensive, and also supra-intensive with their own characteristic. You know that extensive, there is variation there, relatively low density, there is overlapping generation and using the last pond, but uh, there is an evolution goes to the semi-intensive system, there's an aeration there, the density slightly increased, and then the productivity slightly increased up uh, from 
500 kilogram per hectare up to 300 tons until 12 tons per hectare. And the pond size is becomes smaller compared to the extensive production system. And then nowadays the technology goes to full intensive. There's more aeration there. Density is uh, a bit higher, and then the productivity can produce around 50 to 40 tons per hectare. There is uh, some farmer here that also use the super intensive technology where they use the advanced aeration system there. There's a micro bubble, venturi, etc. And then sometimes they combine this micro bubble and venturi. And you can see they up uh, more than 500 uh, post lava per square meter. And the productivity, they claim they can produce around uh, more than 50 tons per hectare. But if we're talking about the optimization of the stream productivity, this is uh, closely related with the use of the technology. Without technology, we cannot do anything to optimize the productivity. So for feed management system, we have to have uh, use the sustainable ingredients, the use of functional feed, and also proper feed management system. And water management system, we have to uh, implement the proper aeration system, what waste, wastewater treatment, water filtration, and also online data recording is very important to make a smart decision during the culture uh, period. And also for biosecurity, it's very also very important to minimize the disease incidents during the culture period. And for culture system, there are a lot of uh, technology that being used right now. There are uh, some symbiotic technology, aquamimicry technology, and this is good, but the farmer need to pay attention to the characteristic of the environment before they apply this technology into the culture system. So the thing is uh, for all this uh, intervention, we need, all the goal is to increase the carrying capacity of the product production system. So if we're talking about the density, feed management system, genetic, water quality, and biosecurity, then all, all of these things have to be related to the carrying capacity of the culture environment. So our colleague from Vietnam already talked about the AQ1 technology. Yes, we also have this technology and I have uh, this research for three years uh, by using the zone-based feeding system here. And we, we can actually see that uh, compared to the use of the normal automatic feeder and compared with the use of the standard feeding strategy, even we also increase the, the amount of feed by using the standard uh, protocol for feeding management. The zone-based feeding system can actually increase the, the individual weight of stream and also increase the productivity of the production system. Biosecurity is very important. And because we, we need to minimize the stress of stream during the culture system and maintain the good water quality, reduce the accumulation of organic matter, and also minimize the abundance of the, of the pathogen. So basically, it's very important. And also, uh, water quality condition, we need to pay attention for this one. We need to have a proper dissolved oxygen system in order to increase the productivity. We also have a research. Uh, we analyze the use of the, you know, the venturi in our uh, pond system. We can see that there is an increase in weight if we if we if we put uh, a proper this uh, oxygen uh, input in our pond. They also related uh, have a positive significance to the to the growth performance of the stream. So positioning is very important in in the stream production system because we would like to increase the availability of this oxygen in all a water column in our pond and we also want to induce the proper water circulation because most of the stream farm today they use the stream toilet and we need to induce a proper water circulation and aerators can be positioned in group to create a very good zone for the good oxygen concentration for carrying capacity we have a rule here for for our uh, stream production system one pedal wheel could cover around 100 and 150 square meter of the pond bottom and one pedal wheel could cover around 25,000 until 35,000 of stream seed and also around uh, 400 until 500 kilogram of stream biomass. Then if they exceed this number, then we have to think about the carrying capacity and we have to apply like a parcel harvest or, or something else and to increase the carrying capacity of the pond. So for the health and clean water is the key to increase the productivity also. We can, we can use the online or real-time water monitoring sensor system that can ha help us to make a smart decision during the uh, production system. But also we have to pay attention to the water management system in each pond and also inlet water treatment system and also wastewater treatment system to make our production system become more sustainable. Wastewater treatment system is very important because this is also 
affect the you know the, the next cycle of our uh, production system. So please pay attention with this uh, uh, water and also wastewater treatment system. So this is one example of the water management system that, uh, normally used. Yeah, uh, smart aquaculture production system now being used everywhere in Vietnam, in, in 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 Thailand, and also in Indonesia. We also use the technology to help us to make a smart decision, and this is very important. And also a lot of technology like uh, symbiotic also have been applied here massively and widely like a symbiotic uh, for disease control and to maintain a poor water quality and also to sustain a good bacteria and provide soluble nutrient for microorganisms. So we have a graph here uh, before and after implementation of the symbiotic in, in our farm in Indonesia. Uh, before the productivity is only 14 ton per hectare uh, after we implement the symbiotic system, they, we can increase the productivity, we can also reduce the FCR, we can increase the sulfur rate, and we can also uh, uh, make the culture period become longer to, to make the productivity become more better and higher. And we can also reduce the ponds that are infected with white flies species and the profit can, and this is also extends that the profit can also increase uh, better compared to the to the to the pond system that do not use any technology during the production system. So other than the symbiotic, we know that the aqua mimicry become more popular here, and mesotrophic become more popular, popular, and also zero water extents also become more popular. But the thing is, uh, we have to pay attention that our pond have the similar characteristic and also similar current capacity to to use this technology. So nursery, I think this is everywhere also. The nursery technology is very important. Uh, this is uh, one of the innovation to reduce the production cost because we have a faster and uh, small PL delivery and also reduce the transportation cost. And we also have a bigger post larvae to be released to the ponds. This is very important to avoid any miscalculation in terms of the number of post larvae that we stock into our pond. And we can also make the reading periods become more shorter. And this, this is, uh, and also even the blind feeding uh, during the early uh, production system. And this is good for, for feed, uh, our pond water quality and also prevent the disease because we, we maintain the, the quality of the post larvae and we enhance the, you know, the non specific immune system be, before we release them into the grow out pond. So in the nursery, we take everything, the water quality, the nutrition, so the post survey that we stock into the pond uh, at least have a better quality compared to the, you know, to the post larvae that normally stock into the pond. So this is a uh, uh, latest innovation here in Indonesia. We have a, a millennial swim farm. Millennial swim farm meaning that we have a commercial round pond technology here that they're using 4.0 based technology. There is an automatic feeder there. There's a water quality monitoring system there. There's a nano bubble technology and equipped with the database culture system, a smart farming system. So everything is uh, controlled by technology and also uh, implemented by the millennial generation here because they have uh, the, the millennial generation love the technology and this makes the production system become more easier and more efficient in terms of the you know the, the product the production system and millennial stream farm use the latest technology, digitalization and internet of things. And this is the design with average diameter of 20 meters and the density of 150 post larvae per square meter. The production is around 1.3 tons uh, per pond or equivalent with uh, 41 tons per hectare. This is uh, still a good number for productivity. And with this system, actually with the technology and the density can be pushed to 200 post larvae per square meter but uh, with one condition, proper feeding and water management system have to be main uh, consideration here. And the take home message for my presentation today for, uh, for everyone is the intensive power system should closely related with the use of technology to optimize the productivity. And sustainable ingredients is very important for intensive culture system to reduce the pressure on the ocean fisheries and more concerned about the use of functional feed and biosecurity in the future because we would like to minimize the disease outbreaks in our in our pond and several active substances can be used to produce the functional diet we can use the phytogenic substance we can use the yeast we can use the probiotics to enhance the growth and also the health status of the stream and innovation is very important to make our productivity become more sustainable and also enhance the effectivity and also efficiency during our uh, production system 
And thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take any question that you have. Thank you. I give it to Dr. Salin. Thank you, Romy. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, you covered a broad range of topics from the functional ingredients to almost a very clear account of the shrimp farming practices in, followed in Indonesia. Indonesia has long been, you know, standardizing the high-tech culture, the high-density, supra-intensive culture, plus with the, with the range of new breed of uh, deep tech companies like the e-fishery or Jala that you have highlighted, uh, really revolutionizing the shrimp farming industry in Indonesia. I think uh, this is going to be the future for sustainable shrimp farming uh, could be for many countries as well. Thank you very much, Romy, for your presentation. Okay, so next we will travel to the Philippines. Dr. Edgar C. Amor from the CIFTEC uh, Philippines. Uh, Dr. Ed Edgar is a scientist and head of the training and information division of the CIFTEC, which is the Southeast Asian Fisheries uh, uh, and Aquaculture Development Agency, uh, headquarters in the Philippines. Um, he had his PhD in aquatic biosciences from the Tokyo University of Fisheries, uh, Japan, and his master's of aquaculture from the University of Philippines, Visayas. He had attended the senior aquaculturist training course of IDRC fellowship uh, at the various NACA regional lead centers in the Philippines, Thailand, China, and India. His research interests include fish or crustacean pond and cage culture, fish nutrition and aquatic animal health, and he has authored 40 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Edgar collaborated with the Philippine Department of Science and Technology and the Philippine Genome Center in a survey of shrimp farms in the Philippines to study the occurrence and pathogenesis of some of the viral and bacterial diseases. Um, and he has also partnered with the University of Ghent in Canada to study the health and growth promoting effects of uh, PHP supplementation in panate shrimp. And he also received the Government of Japan Trust Fund project for surveying the aquaculture practices of small scale farmers and conducting on site trainings in some of the Southeast Asian countries to improve the aquatic animal health services. Uh, in government laboratories. So he also serves as a resource person in the CFTEC Aquaculture Department's training courses and is a member of technical and advisory groups of several Philippine government agencies. So very nice to have you, Dr. Edgar. And uh, we'd be glad to hear your presentation. Yeah, please share your screen. Um. Thank yeah. you, uh, Dr. Salin. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank also the um, organizers, uh, NEDAC, the uh, Anhui Academy of Arts and Sciences, and AAT for the invitation. Uh, let me share my slide. Okay. Um, Can I so be presenting um, an overview of successful aquaculture technologies and yeah, practices? Still cannot see the presentation. Okay, Edgar. Can you share the screen with your? A little bit. Okay, is it okay? Yeah, we can see it. Please make it in a, yeah, perfect. Okay, so I will be talking on uh, overview of successful aquaculture technologies and practices in the Philippines. 
just a little background about the Philippine aquaculture. Um, um, Philippine aquaculture has strong potential for further expansion because of uh, past resources. Uh, 338,000, 390 hectares of swamp land, 14,531 hectares of freshwater fish ponds, 239,320 uh, hectares of brackish water fish ponds, 200,000 hectares of lakes, 31,000 hectares of rivers, and 19,000 hectares of reservoirs. Um, the value of aquaculture production in the Philippines um, from 2015 to 2017 reached about uh, 1 billion or uh, 100 million, and this is in thousand pesos. Uh, one, uh, one peso is equivalent to um, uh, one, one, one peso, 50 pesos is equivalent to one dollar. So as you can see in this slide, um, Bracus Water Fish Pond um, attained the highest production followed by fresh water fish ponds. Uh, marine fish cage, as well as seaweeds. So there's also um, some production in the uh, freshwater and fish, fish pan and, uh, and, and oyster and mussel production, but uh, it's very minimal. In terms of um, volume by species, uh, we can see that the highest production is that of milkfish, followed by tilapia, seaweed, tiger prawn, and um, also some production of uh, uh, alimango or mud crab and uh, freshwater species as scarps also, and um, oysters and mussels, and uh, also um, some production of white shrimps. No? And this is from the intensive uh, aquaculture industry. In terms of value, um, still milkfish uh, attained the highest value at 35 million. Uh, followed by um, tiger prawn and uh, tilapia, seaweed, mud crab or limango, and then Pacific white shrimps. Okay, so I will be uh, discussing um, according to the economic importance of the different species. Uh, first, we'll uh, uh, talk about the low value or high volume marine fish culture in the Philippines, which is milkfish and tilapia. Milkfish production in the Philippines uh, increased from 150,000 metric tons in 1996 up to uh, about 400,000 metric tons in 2017. And the majority of the production comes from um, brackets water fish ponds. Uh, also some production from uh, marine cage culture and very little production from freshwater pan and freshwater cages. So um, milk production cycle uh, starts from uh, uh, broodstock management, which is uh, uh, the maintenance of broodstock until they reach about five to seven years old. And then this is uh, made to spawn in the hatchery. And then, uh, and then the, the fry are cultured in, in the nursery. And then it's um, cultured in different uh, grow systems just like practice water fish ponds, uh, grow out pans, and grow out cages. So in, in CIFDEC, uh, we have facilities for uh, um, growing milkfish at different uh, uh, stages, no? from broodstock, uh, we have the hatchery and nursery facilities, as well as uh, nursery facilities and grow out facilities in our Dumangas practice water station, and in grow out facilities in Igang Mine Station. Okay, so uh, the challenge for, for milkfish production is uh, adequate supply of fry. Uh, the Philippines uh, produced only um, about 1 billion fry. No? And um, the total requirement of the Philippines is about 2.5 billion fry. So the rest of uh, the fry requirement uh, was imported from Indonesia, which offers uh, a lot cheaper price for their uh, fry at about... Uh, um, 25 centavos per piece, while that, uh, the Philippine local price can fetch about 50 centavos per piece. So the ongoing initiative you know, for uh, milkfish is uh, the fry sufficiency program, which is um, uh, uh, addressed by legislating hatcheries. So meaning there are laws that are uh, passed in the Philippine Senate, uh, Philippine legislature, 
on the legislation of the hatcheries or the establishment of the hatcheries by uh, local governments uh, under the different uh, congressional jurisdictions. And then there's also uh, technology on the year-round production of milk fish fry by temperature manipulation. So uh, as before, we are only producing uh, milk fish at certain times of the month because of the colder months in November, December, and January. But now, because uh, we're able to manipulate the temperature, we can produce fry year round. And there's also uh, the production of cost efficient feed. So as mentioned in the previous uh, 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 presentation, um, that the replacement of fish meal is very important. So in this case, we have uh, many, many sources of uh, uh, protein replacers coming from plant sources and as well as animal sources. So for tilapia, um, we have also a, a high production, which increased from about uh, 5,000 uh, metric tons to uh, about 15,000 metric tons in 2017. So this is also a very important commodity for us. Okay, so for tilapia, we have uh, hatchery technology for tilapia, which is uh, either in tanks or in hapas. And um, we have also nursery as well as uh, grow out facilities, both in uh, tanks and cages. Okay, for um, tilapia, uh, the most um, uh, profitable uh, stage of the culture is the integrated hatchery and nursery, because it's there you can get the return on investment of as high as 150%. Whereas the grow out culture uh, is also giving high profit uh, uh, of about um, uh, up or, or above 100% 100, 100, uh, no? return on investment, uh, except that when you are going to culture this in cages, it, it, it uh, lowers uh, uh, considerably, no? uh, only to about uh, 20 to 40% uh, return on investment. Okay, so now we will... Um, uh, discuss the different uh, high value or low volume marine uh, fish culture in the Philippines, which is a grouper, red snapper, pompano, and sea bass. First for groupers, uh, why, why are groupers important? Um, they are a high value fish, they have excellent texture and flavor, they have high demand in local and international markets, and uh, fry are potentially available anytime with the uh, availability of uh, hatchery technology. Okay, for the hatchery phase, um, two, three to 25 tons tons can be used. Um, stocking this with 20 to 30 larvae per liter. Uh, feeding with uh, different natural foods such as artemia and um, uh, rotifers. Okay, nanochlorum is also included as a, a way to uh, uh, support the growth of rotifers as well as to maintain good water quality. Harvest can be done when the uh, larvae are about two to five, two to three cm in total length, and uh, uh, after a duration of sixty days. So this is the protocol for the larval rearing of grouper. Uh, as you can see, uh, nanochlorum is fed uh, until um, day thirty, as well as rotifers and uh, artemia, uh, starting uh, on day fifteen until day forty-five. And um, uh, artificial feed can be used also from day 10 until the end of the culture period. And for the water management, uh, siphoning with tank bottom is done from day, day three until the end of the culture period. And water change is done at 20 to 30% from day three to day 20, 50 to 70% from day 20 to day 40. And the uh, flow through system is adopted from day 40 until the end of the culture period. For the nursery phase, um, we can use either ponds or floating cages, and uh, the, the fry can be stuck at 150 to 200 fry per cubic meters, and they can be fed my seed uh, uh, from 60 to 70 days post hatch, poppy pods from 65 to 80 days post hatch, and crustaceans or young fish from 80 days post hatch until harvest. The fish can be harvested when they reach a total length of about six to 10 centimeters, which takes about 45 to 60 days. For the grow out, uh, we can also use either ponds or floating cages. 
and they can be stuck at a stocking density of uh, 5,000 to 10,000 juveniles per hectare if in ponds, and from 50 to 20 juveniles per cubic meter if in floating cages. Can be fed trust fish at 10% of average, uh, average body weight and uh, or artificial diet at 3% ABW. When they reach about 200 grams, they can be fed uh, 5% uh, of their ABW with the trust fish or 2% of their ABW if using artificial diet. So the culture duration for the growth phase uh, reach about five to seven months when they uh, attain a size of about 300 to 350 grams. Uh, there are some um, criteria to be selected, criteria to be used for site selection of grouper. So the, the, the area should be uh, um, free from pollution or there should be minimal pollution, uh, protected from adverse weather conditions, uh, accessible but uh, secure from poachers because poaching is uh, a problem for um, cage culture. And the area should be at least three meters deep and away from seagrasses and coral beds because this, uh, these are areas that are uh, um, negatively affected by cage culture. So with the uh, increased um, turbidity and the pollution in the area, seagrass and coral beds uh, can be uh, negatively affected. So for brackish water ponds, um, there should be seawater or brackish water with 18 to 32 uh, parts per thousand. Uh, salinity and about 27 to 30 degrees uh, centigrade uh, temperature. And uh, DO uh, should be about 48 ppm. Soil structure should be clay, clay loam, or sandy clay with minimal pollution and accessible but free from poachers. So at the uh, CITIC AQD, um, we um, pay particular attention to the monitoring of uh, water parameters and um, to make the uh, culture efficient, we use a combination of trust fish and formulated diets. Of course, the diets already contain uh, the, the replacement, the locust diet, you know, the uh, diet where protein, a fish meal uh, protein is replaced by uh, locust uh, protein ingredients from plant and animal sources. And uh, as in any um, uh, culture, uh, using carnivorous species, there should be regular sizing of the fish because uh, survival is greatly affected uh, uh, without uh, regular size grading or sizing. And there should also be regular changing and cleaning of the nets and harvest is done when the fish uh, attain a weight of about 300 grams. So for the details of um, the, the uh, grouper, actually uh, culture and grow out, you can visit uh, our uh, repository at uh, cifdec.org.ph. Okay. So you can take a look at this uh, manual and brochures. There's uh, another species which is also very uh, important and uh, high value. Uh, it's uh, Lutjanus argentimetalatus. It is also um, exported to different countries in uh, uh, Asia as well as in the USA. It's a fast growing fish and, and can survive well in different phases of culture. In fact, it's uh, it's uh, um, characteristics that uh, that uh, confer it uh, an advantage to other uh, uh, marine species is that it can easily be weaned from artificial from uh, natural food to artificial diet. So as early as the fingerling stage, it can already consume uh, artificial diet. So for the red snapper, the hatchery phase, uh, we use three ton concrete tanks or 500 liter fiberglass tanks, and the larvae is stuck at 30 larvae per liter and fed with rutifer and artemia and uh, culture uh, hatchery, oh, in the hatchery phase is 25 days. So similar to a uh, grouper, uh, the protocol involves feeding with uh, different uh, live foods such as uh, critifers and artemia and um, supplemented with artificial diet at three to five tons per day of, uh, starting from day 10 until uh, harvest. Okay, nanochlorum is added in order to maintain water quality as well as to support the growth of rotifer. So for water management, similar, uh, siphoning with tank bottom and changing water, uh, 20 to 30% uh, from day three to day 20, 50 to 70% from day 20 to day 40 and flow through from day 40 up to harvest. For the nursery phase, um, similar also to grouper, it's 150 to 120 fingerlings per square meter and fed with formulated diet at 12% of ABW. And this is fed uh, 
the feeding is gradually reduced to 4% ABW as the fish grows. And culture duration is 30 days or until the fish reached uh, an average weight of about 40 to 50 grams. So this is a picture of the nursery hapa uh, where we can uh, culture the snapper in cages installed in ponds. And this is the harvest of 40 to 50 grams of uh, rather uh, juveniles. So red snapper grow out in ponds, can be stocked at 5,000 juveniles per hectare and fed with formulated diet. So this is the feeding rate, um, starting from average weight of 20 to 30 grams up to 251 grams. So the feeding rate uh, decreases you know, from 5% to 2.5%. Okay. And uh, the fish can be harvested when they reach uh, about 400 grams in uh, culture period of six months. So this is the manual and uh, brochure that you can check, uh, repository that's if they got all that pH. For snubnose pompano, um, it is um, also important because um, it is widely distributed in the Pacific region and it is uh, a valued um, species in many uh, countries, not only in Asia, but also in the Pacific, as well as Australia and Japan. So for the hatchery, we can use five ton tanks for larval rearing and can be stuck at 10 larvae per liter, fed with rutifers and combination of rutifers and artemia. And culture duration is 35 days. So just like uh, grouper and snapper, and uh, the, the feeding scheme is the same. So feeding with nanochlorum, um, rutifers, artemia, and supplemented with artificial diet and uh, water management, such as siphoning and uh, changing of the uh, water from 20 to 70%, from zero to 40 days and uh, flow through from 40 to 60 days. For Pompano nursery, uh, you can use either ponds or floating marine cages. Stocking this is similar at 150 and 250 larvae per cubic meters. And they can be fed already with the starter feeds no? uh, or ground trash fish. So at um, nighttime, uh, they can be provided with uh, uh, light no? uh, of about 180 to 200, uh, 200 lux in, in order to attract live food uh, to attain a better growth. And the culture duration is 75 to 90 days. So in addition to the uh, artificial diet, they can be a fed natural food, and this can be done by providing nighttime illumination. And uh, the illumination will attract uh, live food such as uh, mice and uh, copy pots and small crustaceans. So for uh, the grow out phase, uh, juveniles can be stuck uh, at about 12 to 15 grams and uh, reared to market size up to 250 grams or to, to 100 kilograms, no, depending on the uh, preference of the market. So for the stocking rate, they can be stuck at 5,000 uh, 5, per hectare if in ponds and uh, 5 to 30 pieces per square meter if in cages. So in cages, the, net, the nets uh, have to be replaced with bigger size mesh nets after uh, three months. And um, replacement of nets is always recommended because of the uh, biofowlers no, that, that attach the, net, the nets. And they can be uh, fed with commercial pellets and can be harvested in four to seven months. So for the different sizes and the feeding rate, you can refer to this table. So from 20% uh, ABW up to, uh, down to 3% ABW as the fish grows. So this is the uh, manual for the production of snub nose pompano. For sea bass, uh, it's also a highly carnivorous fish, but they can also be trained to feed on a formulated diet. So uh, it is a good species to culture because it is a Uri haline, which means that they can tolerate a wide range of salinity from freshwater to full strands uh, seawater. For hatchery, we can use three to five ton larval rearing tank, which can be stocked at uh, 30 larvae per, lit per liter, which uh, is reduced to 15 larvae per liter on 10 DPH and six liter per liter on 21 DPH, and can be fed with an acloroom, uh, rutifer, as well as artemia. The culture duration is 20 to 25 days. 
So for um, CBUS, uh, the, the protocol is shorter. It only involves about uh, 30 days, no? But the feeding scheme is still the same. So we use uh, nanochlorum, um, rotifers, as, as well as artemia. If you notice, uh, there is no supplementation to artificial feed no, in the uh, reading with CBAS, probably because among the different um, marine species I've mentioned, CBAS is the most uh, carnivorous. And so they prefer um, uh, meat, uh, animal, animal meat rather than artificial diet. For the nursery, um, we can use also hapas or, uh, or earthen ponds. And uh, similar to the other species, can be stuck at 150 to 205 per cubic meter, can be fed with uh, zooplankton, mycetes, and uh, mosquito larvae, or formulated feed also. So grading is very important for sea bass because uh, it is uh, highly cannibalistic. So just like with pompano, um, Light can also be provided to attack zooplankton, to attract zooplankton and encourage uh, foraging during uh, nighttime. So the culture duration is 30 days. For CBAS grow out, um, juveniles at uh, a weight range of 20 to 50 grams uh, can be used. And uh, they can be uh, fed with trust fees at 5 to 10% of the biomass uh, or formulated feed at 3 to 5% of the biomass given two to three times daily. So they can be harvested when they reach about uh, 300 to 600 grams, which takes about four to seven months. So the grow out can be done in ponds or cages. So for pond culture, uh, they can be stuck at 10,000 pieces per hectare. And for cage culture, 15 to 20 pieces per cubic meter. So this is the manual for uh, hatchery production of seabass, as well as culture and grow out ponds. So for uh, um, all marine species, um, this is the working hatchery setup. So there should be a um, broodstock tank no, to maintain the broodstock. Uh, there should be larval reading tanks, which uh, is uh, made up of different sizes of uh, tanks from 10 tons, six, five tons, and uh, rotifer tanks and algal tanks. So the rotifer, rotifer tanks um, um, should uh, be parallel with that with the algal reading. So that the size of course, of the algal tanks is, is bigger, like 15 tanks compared to refer tanks, which is only about 10 tons. So there are also other important commodities that were uh, um, being cultured in the Philippines. And uh, there are also uh, species that are very um, uh, profitable, such as mangrove crabs and seaweeds and giant tiger shrimp. But I will not be discussing anymore the giant tiger shrimp that has been uh, uh, discussed in the previous presentations. So what I'll be highlighting here is the mango crab and seaweeds and some emerging species as abalone, sunfish, and uh, plicate. So for mango crab, um, uh, there is a hatchery stage wherein we uh, uh, collect broodstock. So the, the broodstock are made to mature or sometimes the broodstock also already carry with them their, their eggs. No? Uh, so they are uh, maintained in the tank with some substrate until they spawn. So, after hatching, we collect the soya and stock in tanks at six to eight individuals per liter. And um, uh, proper feeding and water management is uh, done. So this is the uh, feeding and water management, water management for mangrove crab. So in every larval reading, uh, natural food as well as from related diet is important. So here for mangrove scrub, it's a combination of uh, live food and formulated diet, and also um, uh, trust fish or, or muscle meat. So initially, rotifer is given, and uh, after uh, the soya, soya two stage, uh, artemia is given, and then after the soya four stage, or at the start of the soya four stage, um, artemia, or the three-day-old artemia, the bigger size artemia is given, and together with the uh, uh, formulated diet, which is given at 2.25 grams per ton per day, and increased uh, uh, with 0 0.25 grams according to uh, the increment in the growth stage. And uh, muscle meat is given at the megalopa stage and is uh, uh, dispensed two times daily. So natural food, um, uh, phytoplankton is also given, but it is optional. Uh, which is given at 100,000 cells per ml because um, 
optional in the sense that uh, uh, we can do a level reading of uh, uh, mangrove crab even without uh, adding nanochlorum. So this is only to uh, maintain the water quality. So water replacement is uh, done every five days uh, at about 300 to 60% of the total volume. And uh, this is uh, reduced to 30 to 50% of the total volume when they reached the crab instar stage. So the salinity is maintained at 30 to 32 PPT and reduced to 24 to 30 PPT when they reach the megalopa stage. So for the mangrove crab nursery, uh, it is intermediate phase between the hatchery and the grow. So um, crablets um, measuring 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 are grown to 1.5 to, to 2 cm. So this is the phase one. And there's another phase, which is uh, phase two, wherein the uh, larvae are grown from 2.5 to 4 cm. So this is to uh, increase the uh, the uh, survival no, of the mangrove crab when they're already stuck in cages because stocking them at the size of 1.5 to 2 cm is uh, still very risky you know, because it is still susceptible to uh, many um, uh, factors which reduce their survival, such as predation and uh, susceptibility to uh, environmental factors. Okay, so the ponds are enclosed with net fence. So this is also a, a HAPA in, installed in cages and they are provided with shelters to serve as hiding place because they're also cannibalistic. So at least the shelters will uh, reduce cannibalism. They're also fed with muscle meat and low value fish, snail meat or chicken entrails. Okay, at 100% of the weight of the stock crablets per day. So, so if you have, for example, 150 kilos of, uh, of uh, total uh, weight of the larvae, then you also have to use uh, 100 kilos of uh, muscle meat or trash fish. Okay, so if there is a formulated feed uh, available, a combination of 30% 30 wet feed plus 70% formulated feed will be, uh, can be used. Uh, and, and this can be stuck at 30 to 50 per square meter in phase one and uh, five to 10 uh, per square meter in phase two. So this is the stocking density in the different phases of culture. So higher for phase one and uh, reduced in phase two because as, as they grow because uh, the, the HAPA nets can on, uh, only allow um, certain stocking density. You know? And it's harvested after three to four weeks of culture in each phase. So in phase one, three to four weeks and phase two also three to four weeks. So for packing and transport, uh, they can be uh, packed in oxygenated plastic bags with the cool water, which is about 24 degrees centigrade. Okay, so they can be placed in boxes with wet clothes or sand in order to maintain humidity. And they can be transported in early morning or late afternoon or during cool weather. So this is a technical assumption for the mud crab. Uh, we can just focus on the um, total larval rearing capacity. If you have the capacity of 80 tons, no? and uh, assuming you can produce um, an, um, let's call this soya or, or per female of about 1,200,000 and uh, total number of soya to be stuck for maximum capacity is 6,400,000. Uh, you can have um, an ROI of, let's see. It's covered. 42% and a payback period of uh, two years. Okay. So it's it's quite profitable because if, uh, if you deposit your money in the bank and you have a 10% uh, interest, so, uh, hatchery of uh, mangrove crab is much, much better. Okay, so we proceed to seaweeds. So seaweeds is, um, uh, it, it constitutes 80% of the Philippine seaweed export. And it is uh, one of the top three marine based export of the country. It's also a, a top foreign exchange earner and uh, um, alternative livelihood for coastal farmers. It may be eaten, but uh, its usage is more on 
and a wide, wide, wide range of uses such as emulsifier, binder, gelling, and thickening agent in food and non-food products. So for the culture methods, um, there are basically uh, two types, you know, the rough method and uh, uh, the long line method or the floating method. Okay, so for the rough method, we can use bamboo with a square shape. And this is uh, uh, the size of the bamboo raft, 10 meters by 10, meter, 10 meters. And in this bamboo raft, we can uh, tie seedlings of uh, 50 grams per point to uh, PE rope number eight you know, using straw. And then the distance between the seedlings is 25 centimeters. So from, from this point to, to this point, it should be 25 centimeters. So the, the rope is tied to bamboo raft. Okay, so the bamboo raft serves as the floater. And there's also the long line method, which I mentioned a while ago. So this is used in uh, exposed or deep, or, or, or deep water uh, with the, um, a depth of about five to 10 meters deep and with uh, moderate or strong water movement. And um, uh, the, the long line can be single and it could be multiple. So for uh, the single long line, uh, uh, tie the seedlings at uh, 50 grams per point, 200 meter long uh, polyethylene rope, which is uh, uh, has a distance of 25 centimeters between each uh, seedlings. So um, the anchor line uh, uh, can be uh, the, the bamboo stake can be used to uh, anchor you know, the, the uh, hanging long line. So there is also a multiple hugging long line, which is, uh, for example, in this case, for one half hectare, you can have as much as 4,500 meters. Okay, So the same procedure is followed as in a single uh, long line, except that it's uh, arranged in uh, uh, parallel. So, so if you have this uh, uh, long line, you arrange the rows in parallel. So several instead of one. So if, if you have the floater, the bob floater that is uh, anchored by a stake on both ends, so you can use uh, several long lines. No? So this is called a multiple long line. Okay, for harvesting of seaweeds, uh, they can be harvested after 50 days of culture. And uh, in this case, uh, they can be just untied you know, from the cultivation row. And for post-harvest management, um, the seaweeds are clean and then uh, um, they are dried uh, in platforms. No? Uh, they can be uh, dried in a well-ventilated place until they are uh, ready for stocking in, in sacks. And then this is the technical assumption for the seaweed culture. Uh, for a project duration of five years and a culture period of 50 days and number of crops of five per year, five every year of 5,000 uh, square meters, uh, the return on investment is 270% and the payback period of 735 uh, years. So this is uh, very profitable and uh, it requires uh, a lower investment compared to uh, the other uh, technologies. So uh, I'll just touch a little on um, giant tiger shrimp. So at uh, CIFDEC, we are uh, trying to revive uh, the culture of Pinellas monodon and, and because of the non-availability of uh, uh, SPF uh, spawners, we try to obtain uh, spawners from the wild and uh, do a series of screening in order to uh, obtain a, a clean, uh, in close parentheses, a spawner. And um, from this, we can produce fry that is also uh, sequentially screened for different pathogens. And we can uh, use that for culture in grow out uh, using different uh, culture systems, uh, such as the low discharge uh, water systems, or we can also use the biofrog systems. And uh, our intervention is uh, proper waste management, use of probiotics, dis disinfectants, use of DP liner and the stimulants, and the green water system. Okay, so this is the growth phase. And uh, some of the important. Um, uh, emerging uh, species uh, are also uh, considered here. So abalone, 
which is um, high valued as well as uh, um, sunfish or Holoturia scabra. Okay, so there are um, brood stock management uh, schemes for uh, abalone, and this is uh, usually done um, uh, in tanks um, uh, with with the use of red seaweeds as feed. Okay, so the most important is there is a, a, a strong aeration and uh, uh, frequent supply of sun filtered, clean sun filtered water. Okay, so for spawning, um, the ratio that we can use for uh, brood stock, uh, abalone brood stock is four is to one, a female to male. And then there should be a separate incubation tanks, which is uh, supplied with UV irradiated seawater. The spawning occurs at 7 to 7 a.m. And then um, larvae is collected by siphoning and then transferred to larval reading tanks. Okay, for larval reading, um, the, stock, the stocks are collected and transferred to the hatchery tanks at uh, 250,000 to 300, uh, 300 uh, pieces per ton of water. And uh, the larvae are allowed to settle for 24 hours in plates. So there's uh, plates now. So, which are hung vertically in, uh, in, in, in the tanks with the use of poles. And then um, we can re repeat the steps uh, seven to nine until all the larvae have settled. So we remove the plates from the hatchery tank and transfer it uh, to another tank no, until they are all collected, okay? So the harvest is after 90 days when they reach about 10 to 15 millimeters for nursery. Then for nursery, uh, we just uh, thin them out and then still use seaweeds as uh, feed or also some formulated feed. And for grow out, uh, we use juveniles of 25 to 30 millimeters in cages suspended in tanks or in floating net cages or in sheltered coves. Sheltered coves. We still use uh, dead seaweeds or gracilaria no, as their food. So they can be harvested when they reach a 50 to 60 millimeter size within one year. Okay, for sunfish, uh, we have a system for broodstock conditioning and uh, they are fed um, uh, seaweeds also like powdered sargassum as well as formulated feed or navicular. And then we can induce them to spawn um, using a thermal stimulation or also food stimulation, okay? So the, the spawn are made to develop and then, um, and then um, uh, collected, you know, the spawn are collected and then uh, allowed to uh, be fertilized in uh, 20 to 30 degrees centigrade salinity water uh, and with 28 to 30 PPT. So the stage which is known as auricularia is fed with uh, diatoms, no? it also is called trans. So 20 to 50% water exchange every two days. And then uh, after two days, uh, it develops into the, another stage, the leularia. And this is now um, um, uh, uh, fed with uh, navicula slurry, or this is a diatom, also an kind of diatom. Okay, in the nursery, uh, they can be transferred to the uh, uh, floating hapanets, no? uh, one meter by two meter by 1.5 meters in diameter. And uh, they can be grown uh, in the nursery or in pens or in ponds. Okay, so lastly, this is the marfisa, which is a, a marine worm, which is used as feed for uh, a bird stock of uh, shrimp as well as uh, mud crab or sea lacerata. So here I will just showing you uh, the different stages no? uh, from 12 hours post uh, fertilization, 24 hours post fertilization until they develop into uh, early metatrochophore, late metatrochophore, nectocate, and then uh, after 60 to 90 days uh, post fertilization, they develop into late juvenile, and then they mature in 120 to 100 days uh, post fertilization. So this is uh, an emerging species which is very important because uh, it's a, a very uh, good feed for uh, broodstock. And, and uh, once this uh, feed is given, um, the fecundity or the uh, 
you call this the the, the uh, survival no, of the uh, uh, post larvae of uh, many crustacean species is increased. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm turning over the floor to Dr. Salim. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edgar. Wonderful presentation. You have covered a lot of species, a lot of systems, and uh, a wide overview of the Philippines aquaculture sector, sector, especially your focus on the marine sector. So I guess uh, this is there are a lot of things for other countries to learn from the Philippines, especially in the in the marine fish hatchery breeding, the mud crab hatchery farming. And uh, also thank you for sharing the interesting, the informative uh, manual uh, published by SafeTech. If you can provide the hyperlinks in the chat box, I think it will be useful for many participants who can uh, download it, the, the, the marine fish manuals that you have published uh, uh, from Philippines. Okay. We'll, we'll do that, Ali. We'll do. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, place it in the chat box, the, the link, the yeah, link to the repository. Much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edgar. Thank uh, you. So now we will move on to the two most awaited presentations uh, from uh, Singapore and also from Uganda. So uh, we have Dr. Diana Chan. Uh, from the Aquaculture Innovation Center, Singapore. We know Singapore is a small country in the region, but uh, technologically quite strong and sound. And most of the aquaculture systems developed in Singapore are highly resource efficient because uh, the land is limited and the use of high technology is essential for the aquaculture in Singapore. So let me introduce Dr. Diana. Uh, Diana is my good friend. Uh, we also worked together in the World Aquaculture Society Asian Pacific chapter, where she was a uh, is past president of the chapter, and she is currently the deputy center director of the Aquaculture Innovation Center in Singapore, with uh, at least thirteen years of experience in aquaculture consulting, applied research, and training since nineteen ninety seven. Dr. Diana has held a leadership position in academic and technology development at Temasek Polytechnic, where she has been instrumental in leading the co leading and co-developing skill-based training programs for the aquaculture and veterinary industries. Dr. Diana is co-chair of the Technical Committee for Food Production, along with the Singapore Food Agency and the Singapore Standards Development Organization, and has co-developed aquaculture standards with industry associations and farms. She was the president of the World Aquaculture Society Asia Pacific chapter from 2020 to 2021. She's also a member of the FAO's Global Conference on Aquaculture Working Committee on Aquaculture Innovations. Her current interest is in mud crab hatcheries to supply crablets for farms, growth and conservation. Uh, welcome Dr. Diana, the floor is yours. Can you, can you hear me, Diana? Sorry, I actually I just unmuted yeah. it. So can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. You can see my slides, yes? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, okay. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, good day to everyone listening in. I would like to thank Dr. Salim for the introduction and also the opportunity to share about the novel and the disruptive technologies for the highly intensive aquaculture production in Singapore. So just a brief introduction about uh, where I come from. I come from the Aquaculture Innovation Center, which is the center for innovation set up by the government agency. In this case, it's Enterprise Singapore. We support from the Singapore Food Agency just solely to help and work alongside the farms and enterprises interested in developing aquaculture. So our main responsibility is basically to help farms find solutions or adopt technologies that could help them improve yield. So if you look at the slide at the top, you can see a number of institutions. Basically, AIC is rather unique because it works on the consortium model, 
comprising universities and polytechnics, right? And uh, these are usually technology developers and training providers. For, for AIC to come in, we actually the technology translator. So, and we also help to validate those technologies or IPs so that the farms would be able to have access and uh, eventually adopt them. So other than the local farms and enterprises, of course, we also work closely with uh, overseas companies. Um, we receive requests regarding the validation of technology to see whether they are suitable you know, for use in the warm water aquaculture you know, in, uh, around this region. So the objective of my presentation today is to give an overview of the challenges and solutions uh, through technology development for helping in ensuring sustainable production for our aquaculture industry. So next slide. I can move to the next slide. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, it's good. So briefly about the Singapore aquaculture. Now, Singapore is a very small country situated just below West Malaysia. So we are just right next to Johor. And the area is only about 790 meters squared. And the coast, coastline is about 193 kilometers. But we have a very big uh, dense population of about close to 6 million people. So the, you can see where my cursor is, there are actually these areas, the green and blue. The blue areas referring to the coastal farms that we have, they're located along the Straits of Johor. So this is the West Johor Straits, and this is the East Johor Straits. The green area here refers to a land-based farm. Um, they're not, that actually include mainly vegetables, eggs, and some land-based fish farms, okay? So at least about 90% of what we eat is imported, so making Singapore very vulnerable to food supply chain disruption. So as such, uh, Singapore has been seriously looking into food security and has been working with aquaculture industry players to ramp up farm production to produce at least enough to meet 30% of the total nutrition needs by 2030. So we don't have much time left. No, it's a 2030, so it's about another eight more years. So the next slide is to talk a little bit more, introduce about the fish farms that we have in our um, country. So you can see that the top here, where my cursor is, these are all the local fish farms and just next to it, very near to it is the Malaysian fish, fish farm. So you can see that they're all very densely located together, quite close. And this is the West Johor Straits. The bottom part is the East Johor Straits. Again, these are the fish farms and the cleaner waters here, which are actually the depth of 30 meters in, in depth, are the two um, deep sea net fish farming. So there are about total 110 coastal farms, two offshore deep sea net cage farms, and about 10 to 12 land-based farms in Singapore. Most of these are coastal farms about 0.5 to 1 hectare in size. Okay, and they contribute about 85% of the total tonnage of fish produced per year. So land-based farms we do have, as I actually mentioned in the other earlier slide, it was actually denoted in green, but there are not that many, is mainly culturing the freshwater species. So like marble gobi, snake head, and tilapia, and they constitute about 15%, right? For the of the local farm production or consumption. So you can see this top right hand corner here, these are the designated uh, farming sites here and here. And uh, that's where also the different types of fish are uh, commonly found in those sites, mainly depending on the type of water quality. Um, the water depth is not that deep. It's about uh, between five and nine meters as um, the deepest is about 15 meters. But if you go to the southern part, the southern waters, it can actually be up to about 30 meters in depth. So you can see those fish here, they're mainly herbivorous, uh, milkfish, gray mullet. And that is made because the water quality in these straits is not that good. So very often we get the low DO, right? But uh, this, this fish tend to actually survive uh, well in those waters. But in the East Johor Straits, you get, get mainly the carnivorous types of fish. So the water current there is, is uh, much better, is higher. Water exchange is also higher. So that's why a lot of um, this type of food fish is actually grown in there. So, um, so in total, the lice from all the licensed food fish farms, the average fish production per year has been about 4,600 tons averaging between 2013 and 2020. And this represents about 10% of the total annual consumption of live and chilled food fish. So we do have challenges um, in the Singapore aquaculture industry. There are several key issues uh, faced by local aquaculture industry and Singapore not 
is not an agricultural country or aquaculture country. She has no minerals or plantations, but the only resource that is abundant is people. But even then, so we do not have enough um, skilled people trained in aquaculture because there are no local institutions that offer purely aquaculture programs, right, at the degree level, except for a couple or one or two polytechnics. So it's actually a shortage of skilled manpower. So as such, Singapore is really short on land and um, less than 1% of the total land is arable, you know, for agriculture. So in addition, there are also adverse uh, environmental conditions that of, often plague Singapore. And these are usually faced from occasional oil spills, uh, harmful algal blooms. Other algal blooms, there are quite a lot, right, along the Straits of uh, Johor. And also the high operating costs, which comes mainly from the feed costs, the labor and energy costs. Other external factors include will be actually the uh, continuity of food supply, right? Because we get most of the food, 90% of, of what we eat is actually imported from overseas. So recently we have a ban, uh, an impending ban that's going to start on the 1st of June from Malaysia that are going to uh, ban uh, uh, Singapore from importing chicken for a, at least a month. So we do not know how long the ban is going to be. So it, it really makes food security an, an important area that uh, the government is lo seriously looking into. So you can see photo on the right here. Um, this actually shows the dead fish, now that's for sure. And it's actually mainly because of the algal bloom. And the worst hit was actually in 2015, whereby 72 fish farms actually suffered a loss of 600 tons of food fish due to the algal bloom. It is not harmful algal bloom, but it's just, you no know, blooms that actually happen because of the sudden change in the water temperature, surface water temperature and the DO, right? So moving on to that, the next slide is Singapore food story. So as Singapore is not an agricultural country, and we all know that I just mentioned that 90% of what we eat is imported. So we need to find ways of ensuring food supply resilience, right? Continuity of food supply. So Singapore is prone to external shocks and global trends, whereby we had food import bans from neighboring countries shared. Uh, in the past, we had bans uh, on uh, mackerel, shrimp, eggs, even some vegetables, mainly because of their local demand is much higher than what they could provide for exporting to the countries, including Singapore. So it also didn't help when the, there was this COVID you know, pandemic situation, whereby it makes logistics a lot more uh, difficult, a challenge. So to strengthen food supply resilience and food security, what the government has actually decided to do is to emphasize on three broad categories. You have to diversify import sources, grow local and grow overseas. So far right now, Singapore has been getting sources of um, protein, let's say of uh, fish, you know, seafood, vegetables and other food items from more than at least 100 countries, just so to ensure food supply at all times. But by 2030, Singapore farms have been given a target to grow more vegetables, more eggs, more fish to meet at least 30% of the total nutrition needs, right? Through innovation and technology development as well as technology adoption by the local farms. So for the grow overseas strategy, because of the land and manpower constraints, skilled manpower constraint, government supports local farms to do farming overseas, right? Encourage them to export their farm produce you no, know, back to Singapore. So it is actually a win-win situation uh, arrangement as jobs can be created in the host country, right? For having Singapore farms do the production there. And they of, and of course, Singapore can benefit from it with the imports you know, of those produce grown overseas. So why aquaculture? Why, why fish you know, as a source of protein? Why not chicken? Why not uh, other sources of, of, of other protein? So basically our basic nutrition uh, needs right, come from protein, fat, and carbohydrate, right, other than fiber. And protein source uh, can be from animal and plants, right? You have the plant-based protein, the animal-based protein, but usually a plant-based protein is generally less digestible and less absorbable compared to the animal-based protein. And animal protein can come from aquatic or terrestrial, right? Chicken, pigs, no pork, uh, and so on so forth, and fish. But however, terrestrial animals share the same land and airspace as us humans. So in order to actually for, you know, to reduce the carbon emission you know, from the terrestrial farm animals, you know, that will eventually contribute to air and environmental pollution. That's why we focus more on aquatic animals. That's why we focus on aquaculture, right? 
So that will be the pro uh, preferred protein source. There's no competition for space or the air. So the, what the Singapore government is trying to do is to focus more on improving coastal farming, you know, from traditional base to technology base with the objective of enhancing productivity and yield. So on the right side, the table here is actually self-explanatory. You can see that the, those uh, aquatic animals or the animals uh, grown in water compared to those terrestrial, uh, the, the protein uh, availability that is actually produced is quite uh, comparable with the same amount of weight across. So with, next slide is to talk about the Singapore's advantage. Singapore is so small, we've only had 719 meters squared, right? But because of the small size, uh, it makes it a lot easier for the coastal farms to sort of um, harvest the fish and then transport the fish to the main island, right? So in terms of the logistics wise, it's also a lot easier. But because it's small, with limited land and space constraint, right, for farming, in addition to external factors that may affect the food supply resilience, um, it really forces us out of our comfort zone and become driven to find ways of enhancing food security and uh, to overcome the disruption of supply you know, for the local market. So as such, we emphasize a lot on, on developing technologies, uh, encouraging innovation. You know, it becomes a necessity for supporting the intensive and sustainable production so as to ensure there's food security and food supply resilience maintained. So for land-based farms, the government actually supports super intensive farming on small footprint. So you know that we don't have much land, less than 1% of the land is arable. So on the small footprint, we encourage a lot of intensive farming, right? So you can see uh, multi-tiered farming you know, systems that I'll be showing you in the subsequent slides. And most of these farms, uh, they use RS containment systems with good support in terms of the water, uh, technology in you know, the wastewater and waste treatment technology. So Singapore also has got a very good connectivity locally and the region to making it easier to reach out to diversify its food sources. So this slide here shows um, the different types of uh, sea-based farming. We've got the land-based and sea-based farming. So for the sea-based farming, those uh, on the left like this where my cursor are, cursor is, is actually a um, floating platform, fish farms with actually RS containment systems. So they're very round uh, con uh, containment systems that actually grow very high density, stocking density of fish, right? And uh, a lot of these uh, farms here, these are the high technology, um, intensive technology type of farming, whereby they depend or they use or they adopt AI IOT you know, in helping to maintain the farming production, the can husbandry, the health monitoring. So I think in the next few years, uh, there'll be not current, there are two, but the next few years, they actually intend to expand to another, by another five more of such floating uh, uh, platforms you know, for, for farming, uh, aqua, I mean, for farming food fish. In this case, the fish here is mainly the coral trout, uh, sea bass and grouper. So the other two photos here, they are mainly the offshore deep net cage, deep sea net cage farming. So this is actually the one of the largest one. Uh, it's in Barramundi, Asia. It's actually located off the southern waters. Then you can see that there's a lot of uh, fish, right, that is being harvested. Uh, there'll be actually another uh, offshore, similar offshore deep sea net cage farming, whereby the waters, the depth there is about 13, up to 30 meters uh, in depth. The bottom part is actually an example of another floating fish farm. Right, that's actually using net cage. So this is becoming like a little community you know, that is actually uh, set up on the sea. So the next slide is actually on the land-based farming and it's, it's mainly a lot on a smart intensive food fish farming. So you can see that um, the pictures here, they're both the same, they belong to the same farm and this is the vertical aquaculture farm with eight stories each uh, with a target of about 2,700 tons of fish per year. That is the target they're supposed to reach. They are growing mainly coral trout, grouper, and vaname. So each of the eight levels has about um, two by 135 meters squared tanks that are run by smart technology. So you can see this guy here is actually looking at the uh, dashboard, right? Whereby it is controlled by IoT and even with uh, AI. And uh, what, what they have actually found out is that they, could, they only need to replace uh, water like about 5% water replacement needed. So that's, it also helps them to save on water costs. 
So the other type of the land-based farming is the shrimp farming. And again, the two types, you can see here, this is outdoor tented uh, raceway, right? Shrimp farming. And the other one is actually indoor, in, inside the industrial space, the warehouse, whereby it's actually multi-story, multi-tiered uh, shrimp farming. So um, the annual production of this one raceway targeted is about 120 tons of vaname annually. It also is a shrimp hatchery. Apparently this company is a blue aqua. Um, it has got shrimp hatchery with target production of up to about 100 million post larvae per year. So it adopts again, artificial intelligence for water quality monitoring, health monitoring. Also they recycle food waste and treat it as a source of food ingredients, feed ingredients for making the, the feed for both the shrimp as well as the fish. So this is the uh, another company called the Universe Aqua. It is the only one that grows very intensively, multi-tiered system, six trials running under control RS conditions and also antibiotic free conditions. They also make use of IoT and AI. Um, they can produce up to 25 tons uh, weekly or 300 tons of sh uh, shrimp, the vaname, yearly on the 0 .2, uh, 0 0.28 hectare of land. The other slide is actually upcoming um, a farm. Uh, it's also by actually Blue Aqua that's working very closely with a, a Danish company in actually uh, adopting their RS system. So this is also, uh, they're targeting about 1,200 tons of uh, rainbow trout. Okay, it's a freshwater fish. Uh, they, then, and they believe that they're also wanting to develop green, and, green technology for energy as well as carbon efficient urban farming through partnership with other companies. So all this actually up and coming. So the next slide is actually to show you the integrated approach to land-based farming. So this is actually our vision that more and more of such farms will be coming up uh, with the support from the government. And of course the technology developers and the uh, 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 providers, right? So for this one, to explore ways of developing energy and carbon efficient urban farming by harvesting the natural, resources like the sun rays and the rainwater, right? And using natural means of filtering this spent uh, water from fish tanks uh, by adopting aquaponics, right? And whereby you, you get to grow vegetables here uh, or in other aquatic plants, you know, while actually cleaning up the water you know, partially and uh, before it descends for further treatment and then it goes back to the fish tank. So to actually maximize the space, there's also algae production on the rooftop. So this algae can also, when grown, can be used as feed, right? For the uh, lava, the, the fries and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a more on a, a circular type, you know, approach whereby, you know, to try to actually reduce a zero, I mean, to approach, uh, have a zero waste management and, and at the same time, try to enhance the production. So the other slide, the next slide is uh, Acropolis, which is actually uh, like a floating township. So, um, this is actually the, the brainchild of a company that the local company is actually kind of working with an overseas company in trying to build this township. And it is actually based on the concept of a future food city you know, that can be self-sustaining by having mixed crop production, cultivation of vegetables, seaweed, and fish. And it will be a multi-story floating and closed containment farming system, right? Uh, with sensors, fit with sensors, AI, for water quality monitoring, feed monitoring, and health as well. And uh, they will also adopt hydroponics, aquaponics, and other farming technologies. So in order to actually encourage um, aquaculture activities, the government has actually earmarked or identified space in, in Singapore, right? And uh, these are the three locations in orange. You have the Lim Chukang area, which is about 390 hectares, the Agri Food Innovation Park, and of course the Southern Waters, which I just mentioned where uh, Baramandi Asia was. Is right. So for this slide on the um, Agri Food Innovation Park, um, this land that is amount uh, that's actually located is about eight, eighteen hectares, and it's dedicated for uh, high tech indoor farming. You can see this building here. You can high tech indoor farming, uh, and also for aquaculture hatcheries. So for hatcheries, they don't need they, they they can be on land. They don't need to be actually on the sea. So this is actually dedicated for such purpose, and of course, other than R and D and prototyping. The other um, area that's earmarked for aquaculture or agriculture development is the Lim Chukang Agrotech Park. It spans over 390 hectares, right? And again, this is actually for high-tech 
every food cluster or food manufacturing hub where both aqua and the agriculture produce will be, uh, will be made and it will be located. But also they will be inviting um, companies that actually technologies that are good you know, for wastewater treatment, waste treatment, um, that will be actually all centered in that space. So this is actually what the government has been doing or trying to do, in fact, other than providing infrastructure, the space, but also pro providing funding schemes, as well as incentives for those who actually want to actually do aquaculture. And also with the EDB support, which is Economic Development Board, um, they're also encouraging overseas uh, pa uh, partners or investors or companies to actually set their base, set up their base in Singapore and to see how the technologies can be actually used for helping Singapore aquaculture industry to grow. So for the um, second last slide, this is actually on Singapore being an aquaculture innovation hub. So with limited land, water, energy, and manpower resources, it provides Singapore the, the impetus to actually maximize and optimize what we have by adopting the concept of grow more with less and really force us to think out of the box, think creatively to develop technology, right? IP and know-how. But in validation of developed IPs by research institutes can be done through testing. And also, you know, in order to actually have farms having this, a good agriculture practices, we are also into developing standards and farm certification. So at least to help the farms know what it means to do it responsibly you know, for aquaculture and also to attain some form of confidence you know, that their produce is of a certain quality when they, if they were to actually market it. So we can become the R&D hub for aquaculture, especially where intensive warm water aquaculture is about. And we can also export technology to our local farms when they farm overseas. So the need to be reliant on seed stock is really important because we only have like one to two hatcheries and we depend a lot on imported fries. But many of those fries, they don't get to survive you know, upon reaching the farms. So that's why developing breeding strategies and seed stock quality is really very important. Um, the fish that we are actually focusing on is snapper, grouper, and sea bass. So Singapore can also be a launching and landing pad, you know, launching pad for local and overseas companies uh, to test build the technologies, IPs or products through our aquaculture innovation center, right? When they set up the base or startup, hopefully the technologies could be translated and then adopted by our local farms, right? To help them improve the farming management as well as the production. Singapore is also ranked by the World Bank as Asia's top logistics for 10 years in a row. And this is because Singapore is known for you not know, to have uh, to be a secure, highly efficient logistics and supply chain management hub. So Singapore will work towards enhancing seafood um, processing capabilities. Uh, Post-harvest technologies and fish waste, you know, or byproducts can be hydrolyzed to give uh, hydrolysate, fish oil, and protein, right? As well as other meaningful products that can be used back for supporting aqua farming and production. So in Singapore right now. We are actually looking at grow more with less. We're also looking at zero waste management. So NEA or National Environment Agency and the SFA are also working very close, you know, closely together, hand in hand, to see what can be done to maximize the usage of land without incurring environmental pollution, right? For aquaculture and for agriculture production. So I think the the second last slide is actually to just a promo about the World Aquaculture Conference that we're going to have in Singapore. There's uh, from 29th November to 2nd December. And you may wonder why, why in Singapore? It was actually supposed to be held in 2020, right? But because of COVID has been postponed uh, a couple of times and uh, we're very glad that it's been finally been held this year in, in November. And uh, Singapore is not an agriculture country, it's not an aquaculture country, but yet the conference is here. I think mainly because we are known the, um, for the technologies and innovations that we are driving very hard Know, to actually do, know, to help the industry grow, especially the aquaculture industry is concerned. So I think with that, that is um, all. That is, this is my last slide. Our logo is actually uh, one identity, one goal. And uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to write in. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Diana. Wonderful. Yes, uh, you, you presented the whole spectrum of uh, high technology uh, uh, practices in Singapore. I think Singapore is going to be home to the 
to what future aquaculture will look like in Asia. So, all the best for Thank your. You. Thank you. Uh, I think a uh, uh, lot of examples for other countries. Um, and and I guess there will be some questions too at the end of the session. So uh, we can now move to the, from production to, to marketing or value addition. We have great examples from Africa, particularly uh, from Uganda, where we have Ms. Lovin, Kobu Singye, uh, who is the owner of Cati Farms. And Ms. Lovin is a vibrant businesswoman working as the chief executive director and co-founder of Cati Farms Limited in Kampala, Uganda. She holds a bachelor's in food science and technology and a master's in business administration. She has been working on fish processing and value addition with her two partners and nearly a thousand other fish farmers for over 10 years. She's a president of the Eastern Africa Women and Youth in Fisheries and Aquaculture Network and a treasurer of the African Women Fish Processors and Traders Network. She's also the vice chairperson of the investment committee for the Enable Youth Program Uganda and a national technical committee member of the Uganda National Bureau of Standards of Fish and Fisher Products. One of her most significant achievements was winning the Africa Agribusiness Innovator of the Year Award in 2012. She has also received recognition from the Rabobank Foundation, the FAO, the European Market Research Center, EMRC, uh, for her innovative solutions to post-harvest losses in the African fishery sector. I think this is uh, going to be an interesting presentation with her long years of experience as an entrepreneur, uh, how we can add value to the fish that we produce. Lovin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarin. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who is on this platform. I'm very delighted to be invited today here to give my perspective uh, in relation to Africa. Um, my name is Lovin, as Dr. Sarin has already introduced me. I am going to present to you technologies and uh, very addition uh, in Africa. Uh, my company, Kati Farms, uh, most of the photos will be from Kati Farms, but I'm also going to have pictures shared from other African countries, especially on the technology aspect. Um, Lovin, can you make it the presentation mode, the PPT? Okay. It's not in the, I don't even know how to do that. Okay, let me try. Is it very small? Can, Hello? You, can you try Alt F5? I'm trying to make it bigger, but I don't see. If you if you click Alt plus F5, uh, are you using a are you using a Windows PC or? Yes. Um, if you can press Alt plus F5. It's five. I'm not seeing it anywhere. Okay, okay, okay. Um, or I already sent the copy to your sister, the lady who is helping us with the, maybe she could help me to share yeah, from her side. Sister, can you yes, present it for her? Yeah. I stopped sharing on my side. Yeah.
Uh, I'm sharing you my my Gmail. So can you please send to that email? I've sent to your usual email, the one we have been using for communication. You already have a copy, uh, Sita. Uh, no, sir. I think the Outlook is not uh, receiving that PowerPoint file. Okay. Could you please send it to me again? To my Gmail account. Okay, no worries. Let me send it right away. Thank you. We are sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I think we can use at this time if uh, we can use for some question answer if somebody has a question until we get to the presentation. Um, do any of you want to ask a question to the previous speakers? Uh, you can feel free to open and ask a question in this forum. Do you have any questions on the previous presentations? Dr. Diana is not here now, but she'll be happy to reply over email or you can post any questions here so that I can coordinate getting the response from her. Any other questions that uh, anybody wants to raise? Um, I have a question, Dr. Uh, Dr. Somani, are you here? Or Romy, uh, Dr. Romy, are you here? Yeah, Dr. Salin, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I have a question uh, yeah. regarding the high, the superintensive shrimp farms in Indonesia. All right. Um, so, you know, the stocking densities have moderated from the top 1,000 to 500 to now you say 300. So in this transition, uh, were there small farmers involved or was it done by big corporations uh, how the role of small holder farms in this technology transition? Yeah, uh, Dr. Salin, thank you for the question. So most of the traditional farm here, we, we, we classified the, the, the farm system into three uh, big classification. First is traditional farming system. Second one is the middle farming system. And the third one is the advanced farming system. So for traditional farming system, the density that they use is normally around 20 to 50 post larvae per square meter. And then for uh, middle scale, it goes up to 100 and until 150. And advanced uh, farming system, it goes for more than 200 post larvae per square meter for, of this uh, per pond. So the transition thing is uh, why, why, when, when they decide to move further is, is, uh, is about the, the, you know, the technology and, and also the, you know, the capital investment. So when they, they, they feel like uh, they, they can operate better and then they can, if they can feel that they can have a better productivity, if they apply technology, then they, they can go for the high stocking density. But be careful about the high stocking density, uh, especially about the sustainability things. 
and also uh, considering about the you know the waste, uh, especially from the uneaten feed and feces, uh, because the dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus coming from the feed is also as a good substrate for the growth of the bacteria and also the pathogen in the surrounding environment. So uh, the thing is, uh, it depends on the farm and also the farmer's uh, decision and, and the goal. But if they go for the uh, high stocking density, our regulation that they have to have at least 20% uh, of the area is the wastewater treatment system. So the wastewater treatment system, they have to build this and then integrate it into the into the production system. So by doing this, we, we also protect the farmers not to have only one or two crops with a good uh, productivity. And then the, the third one have a, a significant reduction in terms of the productivity. So we want to protect the farmer to have a consistency in terms of the productivity and also protect the environment and protect all the farmers to have uh, more uh you know a sustainable environmental farming system so this is our goal dr salin in the in the uh and this already implemented since uh, in the last five years and most of the traditional farming system right now they build a communal a wastewater treatment system and for the advanced and also the middle middle uh, section of this uh, farming system they already have by the by their own self so yeah so technology is the main factor that trigger this transition uh, dr salim but they have to have uh, this wastewater treatment in, in into our the, the production system yeah do the farmers have a desire to form clusters or cooperatives or do they do they operate just individually in their farming operations uh, they are they are they are either way uh dr salin they can can work as a group they work, can work as a joint venture and they can also operate by themselves well it depends on the the, the strength on the capital investment yeah yeah excellent yeah thank you very much dr yeah. romi yeah You're cheers yeah yeah i think now we are ready to go for the, the presentation by dr lovin um yeah Rishida, are you ready to show? okay You can. Thank you, doctor. And I'm ready now for the presentation. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Africa has been steadily growing in uh, uh, the aquaculture sector has been steadily growing. And uh, some farms have been able to invest uh, a big amount of money. And uh, they are making profit. Uh, and here it, it is determined by the the, the quality of the inputs such as feeds uh, and also and the, the right market. Uh, he, the African uh, fisheries sector, especially the aquaculture sector ha, has evolved from the 1950s. Uh, it has been uh, going on in small earth ponds. Uh, as you can see, traditionally, the, the farmers were really doing it on their own without technical extension services, uh, but currently there has been a change. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have uh, examples of new technologies that we have adopted, like cages. Continue, please. So we are doing cages in fresh water. We are also having technology in, in doing tank systems, uh, both circular and, uh, uh, and all kinds of concrete. We have a lot of examples. Please continue. Uh, we also have these concrete uh, tanks whereby investments have been done in, a, in making sure that we have these research rating systems. Uh, and uh, aeration and all that's happening in different parts of Africa. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can see here we have these cages uh, in here in Togo, uh, and the farmers have really invested massively in making sure they feed Africa and the rest of the world. Continue, please. Yeah, we also have this circular uh, cage in the lake Kaliba, this is in Zambia. And this Yarero has really invested so much. Uh, and this is circular tanks also 
continue to mainly photos and then uh, this is concrete terms, but this is intensive on big scale. And we have cages here in West Africa in Ghana. Uh, this is a big farm and there are lots of investment. Continue, please. Uh, this is what I was saying about some farms have uh, been able to invest and make profitable ventures with access to right inputs and markets. Uh, and those are examples of a few farms uh, who have invested about $4 million in this business. Continue. That is mainly from the data collected from the available data because some farmers are doing production without records. So I cannot reliably really say I know how much they are producing, but from the few farmers that are doing commercial production, we have been able to see that Africa has invested more than $4 million into aquaculture uh, and it is a profitable venture. Thank you, continue please. Uh, growing aquaculture sector in Africa requires a lot of, of effort. Uh, we need to go industrialization. There has been a lot of uh, new innovations like cages, like uh, uh, diversification of products, whereby we have to have to innovate so much to be able to have a good price for our aquaculture products because we are doing competing with the capture fisheries. We have a lot of free fish that we get from the lakes and rivers and the oceans. So most people don't see why really they should invest in aquaculture, but for aquaculture has really been competing uh, profitably with capture fishery. And uh, we have had uh, uh, tremendous growth. We have data, we have standards, uh, and we are also learning much more from you. We are trailing behind the Asia, but uh, we know we will catch up uh, soon. Next, please. Uh, here we have mainly seen that with the, with the working in groups or cooperatives is a, a good model for farmers to do aquaculture. The power of working in team, uh, this is really very possible when you're together because they can cut on the cost of production by sharing to import feeds, by sharing to import inputs, uh, and also sharing knowledge and, and bulking when it comes to marketing. So this is why we, we have seen success stories uh, on areas where farmers have been able to unite and have cooperatives. We have women cooperatives, we also have men. Uh, and youth cooperatives. Next, please. The aquaculture value chain in Africa is, uh, is, is very simple. It is not, uh, we don't have so much really, but we have what is required for us to be able to globally say or compete. Uh, the, we mainly have the sector having the input suppliers and here we have both private and public uh, investors. Uh, we have production uh, where small scale farmers uh, and also big scale farmers are placed. We also have the area of processing and here we have investors going for commercial fish processing. Then we have transport and logistics, the retail and then the consumers themselves. Let's continue. Uh, we also have had uh, a lot of uh, uh, science uh, helping farmers to improve on the genetics of the fish because for us to be competitive, we need to go, uh, we need to really invest much in having the, the genetics of the fish that we are farming or improving on the, on the fish so that they grow faster. Uh, and uh, here we have been also getting some more uh, experience from other countries like Asia. We have had uh, people coming like to, to, to Asia to learn more uh, about fishery, uh, going to China. All these have been uh, experiences uh, that have helped Africa to improve on the, what they have. And the universities are doing a commendable job in making sure they support the farmers and, and the ministries. Thank you, let's continue. 
So we have uh, SMEs also uh, investing into uh, in feeds, like feeds and, uh, and, and also investing in the hatchery. Uh, all this uh, have helped farmers to innovate. They are using lava, they are using flies to, to mix. Instead of mixing fish, they are using now lava and flies to be able to have the protein uh mixture with the other ingredients to be able to have a complete meal for the fish and they have gone industrial it is not just at small scale because we have companies that have gone industrial in providing africa uh, farms with feeds next please and we also have uh, uh, many youth and uh, other people in the value chain who are investing in, uh, in making uh, inputs for farmers, like uh, uh, having fish graders, uh, those who are investing in cage farming. There's a lot of innovation happening uh, on the continent. Uh, we have so many cottage uh, feed makers, so many people doing uh, uh, what does, you know, doing cages, cage frames, hoppers, uh, all that, and also people who are doing extension. Uh, in, in making sure that the farmers have uh, good profits. Pro continue, please. Uh, from this aquaculture, we, will, we have come to learn that uh, the best model to, to go by is the market-driven in investment model, whereby you must know the market before you think about production. Uh, because we've realized that if you go to production without necessarily knowing where you're going to sell your fish, it's always very hard and uh, you can be caught up by time. So uh, much as we invest, we also do try to make talk to, talk to farmers about mindset change uh, and also uh, uh, changing from being subsistence to commercial uh, and also producing pro for profit, not just to produce for for home use or subsistence, but to make sure that if you are to produce fish, you are producing for profit and you are going to sell to a certain market, you, you have contracts for delivery beforehand. Thank you. Let's next slide, please. We also uh, advocate in Africa, many farmers have gone further to have the, the farmer enterprise budget. Uh, and this is mainly to monitor the profitability of their fish. Next slide, please. Uh, we will do marketing experiences from Kati Farms. Uh, this is a company that I formed a long time in 2012. Uh, and here, uh, next slide, please. We will go to different value addition initiatives that we have come up with. From the fish, we can see that we can have uh, so many products. We have like the fish skin. Uh, so for aquaculture to grow, we have to think deeply into what uh, more valuable, more profitable products we should invest in. So this fish skin from local uh, fish from our country, we have transformed it into handbags for women to be involved at this end of the value chain. And we use the skin from the fish, from the factory, the fish that has, where the fillet and the meat has been removed. So this is off cuts. We are not, we are using off -sus. So continue, please. So this poor, these nice, beautiful bags are made from fish skin and they are about $30 each of that. And the, the big ones are around $180. Let's continue. Yeah, I think you can see how beautiful they look and they have Uganda on them. Let's continue, please. We also go further to have other products like edible ones, like sausages. Uh, these sausages are, are actually very, very uh, profitable and they are also marketable on the market compared to the meat sausages. The price is premium. Uh, and we have had this promote the aquaculture sector. We have had many farmers uh, be able to now sell to us uh, a lot of their fish to be able to transform it into fish sausages, fish fillets, fish powders. Uh, we have 17 products from fish. Next slide, please. Yes, next slide. Again. Yeah, so yeah, before you leave that, the I was going to show the body addition and uh, you've moved faster than me. 
Uh, that one, you see a, a range of products. So this helps us to be able not to bore our customers. You have to have a lot to be able to keep your customers you know, uh, waiting for more, what is next? They, they will not only eat sausages every day, so they would love to eat uh, fish burger, they would love to eat uh, powders for babies and elderly people. So we have had all these branded products on the shelf and they are, are selling well at a profit. Next, please. Yeah, so we also encourage the, the working with the uh, aquaculture cooperative groups uh, and he innovation platforms, these are very strong. They, they bring out the, the quality of the fish that we buy from cooperatives is always better. There is also, it is very easy for Africa to people to access credit uh, once they have the, the, they are in groups than if you are an individual farmer. Uh, there is also uh, easy access to markets. So we really uh, were very delighted when we saw this meeting because I, I really wanted to learn more from here how this cooperative that has been in existence for many years is, is serving the people in Asia. Uh, and also there is a lot to learn, a lot of capacity building. So in Africa, we are also coping and we are, we are learning and we are growing. And I hope that uh, we shall do better by promoting more of the cooperatives to, uh, for, to be able to serve our farmers in, in fisheries. Next slide, please. Well, Africa has also embraced technology uh, in, as, in, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, these uh, aquaculture innovations that smart aquaculture. We have already farms uh, using, uh, using uh, phones, to monitor their, 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 their farms, to be able to monitor the, the water quality. Uh, they have gadgets to monitor water quality, ammonia, pH, feeds. So all of this shows that Africa is, uh, is, is, smart, is joining the smart aquaculture and uh, this is really promising. And they also use it for data correction and for banking and for uh, all this end, end, to, end to end user learning. Uh, also mobile marketing. If you want to market your fish, you just send a message to the platform and it's very easy to, to be able to communicate with uh, fellow farmers and what is the price today, uh, how much is price, to, you know, yesterday. What, uh, so it's really been nice and we, we see a lot of transformation happening around the continent because of these technology initiatives. Next, please. Uh, so this is actually my last slide and uh, we recommend my recommendation for the future uh, of aquaculture is that we should encourage more innovation platforms and strong cooperative groups for aquaculture uh, group for on the, on the global uh, platform to grow. Uh, we should also aim at having tailored capacity building training programs uh, that are fit for farmers. The, the, pro the training should be tailor-made to the country's situation because you may bring a training maybe in water quality, uh, maybe from another country, the example may not work in another country. So we also need to do more research uh, or, or, on climate smart technologies for scaling up because uh, we really need to protect the environment. We really need to, to also bring safe food to the people. So we need to bring and um, be beautiful, I mean, uh, safe, uh, cancerous, safe smoking killings, uh, uh, feeds that are safe for human consumption because some feeds also have been proven to not to be good for, for people. Oh, so if the fish feeds on them, then we, we, we have issues with, with quality and standards. And with that, uh, I wish to thank you so much for your time. And I am looking forward to more uh, learning and questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Lowen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's an interesting account of the value addition in, in Africa because tilapia is 
very common fish in Asia. And uh, people only know how to eat tilapia, but uh, using the, the, the waste or other things, those byproducts to make value added products from tilapia is uh, quite emerging. And uh, it's happening in many countries, but not so commercially. So if Africa can set an example of how extensive it, this can be done, and this is really a good model for other countries, uh, especially in Asia. So uh, that officially ends the, the technical presentations for today. We have already exceeded the time. Uh, so if you have any urgent questions to ask to any of the speakers, we can go for a Q&A session um, or we can wrap up this meeting and you can still keep asking the speakers more questions by email. So do any of you, uh, any, any of you have any questions, please pop up and open your speaker and camera and, and speak. If not, I think I will, uh, I think it's uh, because it's already time because it has been a long session today. So I don't want to keep you sitting before your computer for a long time. Um, if there are no questions, uh, we can uh, wrap up these sessions. And uh, Professor Jiang, do you have any comment finally to the audience? Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Salen. And Mr. Uh, Jiang tells me that he wants to tell you that today's order symposiums and order professors give a very wonderful presentations and we learned a lot and we get a very very useful knowledge today uh, and at this moment uh, we are also very looking forward uh, you and all the experts uh, who had presentation today uh, can some opportunities going to China for our guidance and we can search the cooperative opportunities together and we can research and develop together and get some mutual benefits and it makes uh, our efforts to the agriculture together. Thank you very, very much. Excellent, thank you very much. That is a good fine note for collaboration because this is what is expected from this meeting as well, because this is a forum for networking among scientists, farmers, industries, entrepreneurs uh, for making the right connection taking the right signals from others and disseminating or implementing in their own countries. So with this positive note, I would like to wrap up this session and thank you very much for all your cooperation. And uh, uh, please keep updating, uh, keep checking with the updated uh, websites of NIDAC, AIT uh, to keep the, to learn more about this symposium updates. The presentation recorded video will be posted in the YouTube channel and uh, hope to meet you all again soon and over to you, Rasita, for the thank you note. Thank you, uh, sir. Yes, we understand. Uh, if we have some questions and we can just get the email from the other professors. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all, Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Lee, Honorary Director Nida, Dr. Salin, and all participants. Uh, on behalf of Nida, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Lee Zhe Fu, President of Anhui Academy of uh, Great Cultural Sciences China to take our time from his busy schedule to grace the event. Thank you for encouraging us with your words on this special day. 
a special thanks to Professor Jiang Ye Lin uh, from Anhui Academy of Agricultural Sciences, China, for providing immense support to make the event successful. I extend my gratitude to Dr. K. R. Selin, Honorary Director, NIDA, and Chair of Aquaculture Program, AIT, for organizing the event and moderating the whole session to ensure it runs smoothly. And my sincere thanks to keynote speakers, Professor Jiang Ye Lin, Dr. Somoni, Dr. Tuan, Dr. Romi, Dr. Edgar, Dr. Diana, and Ms. Lovin for the informative and useful presentations. Also, I would like to thank to all attendees for your attention. Uh, your contributions are really appreciated. And thank you all for your contribution and making this symposium a success. Hope to see you again in the next future events. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.